if we could take our seats, we'd like to get started. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Please take your seats. The diplomats are very ready. Yeah, Once we put in the culture and the videos, Good morning, everyone. Has everyone found their seat? Good morning, Colonel. <laughs> Good to see you here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm Josette Sheeran, the President and CEO of the Asia Society. This morning I hold in my hand a small vial of sand. I carry it with me. It is sand from the place where my parents grew up, sand from the place where they were married, sand from the place where they dreamed their dreams and shed their tears, and it is sand from the place where they were buried. Why do I keep it with me? Because it reminds me from where I come. It reminds me that I'm connected not only to the dreams of my parents, but those before them. <coughs> the science of DNA testing, in fact, tells us today that most of us are connected to places in the world that we didn't even dream we were connected to. I have learned, and now seen through such testing, that I am not only American, not only French and Irish and English and German and Swedish, but also have long brush strokes li linking back across North Africa, the migration from east to west throughout history that swept across Central Asia and also across the Maghreb. We as humanity like to build our walls and say we are separate. We are not in this together. Whatever it may be, but science is proving otherwise what we know deep in our own souls from the echoing voices of our ancestors that we are not separate. This brings me to our very urgent gathering today, one that is unique in that it brings together the power of governments, the power of the United Nations and global conventions, together with the cultural, NGO, military, technology, media and business leaders and experts to explore the urgent threat to our heritage and the treasures of our shared history. Why is it when we stand in the mighty pyramids of Egypt or the haunting beauty of Petra that time stops and eternity seems present? Why is it we feel we're on hallowed ground? It is not just because of the haunting beauty and daunting artistic, engineering, scientific prowess of those who came before us, but it's also because we connect so deeply to our shared heritage and our humanity. The human quest not only to survive, but to thrive and lift our heads and to create beauty and to live on through these creation connects us not only to those behind us, but to those who will follow us. These sites are for no one person or group to take, to remove, to destroy, to pillage, to steal, to covet for themselves, or to use as fuel for death, intimidation, and destruction. And today we are confronted with a new horror, what has been dubbed blood antiquities, as they are being called. We have lost much throughout past years from Timbuktu to Palmyra to the Buddhas of Afghanistan. But today we seek to find new ideas and new solutions, new coalitions, new energy. 
ones that build on the remarkable convention adopted on November 16, 1972 by UNE the UNESCO General Conference on the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World's Cultural and Natural Heritage. With 191 nations ratifying, it's one of the most adopted international instruments in history. This convention was inspired, in fact, in 1959 by Egypt's appeal to UNESCO, a unique one, and to the world to help it protect the treasures of Nubia in the Nile Valley from flooding. Today, we will also honor those nations, those archaeologists, those cultural leaders, those monuments, men and women, who have labored often with very little financial support or support of any kind to protect, preserve our shared heritage. Our calls to action at this time will not be the first, will not be the last, but are perhaps the world's most urgent yet with hundreds of sites already destroyed in the past year alone. We at Asia Society, Asia Society feel deeply linked to this issue. We were founded 60 years ago by John D. Rockefeller III, who devoted his life to building bridges of understanding and respect with the nations of Asia and the West. He founded it after witnessing the devastation following World War II and being deeply moved by the loss of treasures and used his own treasure to help rebuild incredible sites such as the Imperial Library of Japan and to found this institution to continue this work not only through Track 2 dialogues and peace building efforts uh, but also and in policy and you'll hear from our inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, Kevin Rudd, in a moment, but also to do the museum shows like the one we have here today, The Treasures of Forgotten Kingdoms, which take us back a millennia to see the remarkable craftsmanship, artisanship of a civilization in the Philippines long before colonial um, ships arrived and the remarkable level of these, which are so contemporary and current that they seem relevant today to the design and the aspiration of, of people today. And so today I want to thank in particular uh, all those who have come together. As I said, it's a unique group. Um, I want to thank His, Excellence, His Excellency Dr. Ibrahim al-Jafari, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Iraq, His Excellency Nassar Judeh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Jordan, thank you, His Excellency Sameh Hassan Shukre, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Honorable Julie Bishop, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Commonwealth of Australia, who will be joining us in just a minute. I also, yes. oh, <laughs> you arrived, thank you, yes. Good to see you. <laughs> and I also want to thank our partners in this effort, um, Deborah Lair, who's chair of the Antiquities Coalition, who was described this morning simply with one word, amazing. You'll hear from her later today. Kate Seeley, the Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute, and of course, UNESCO, of which I will now move to my introduction uh, for Irena Bakova. So I'm now honored to welcome back to Asia Society, Dr. Irena Bakova, Director General of UNESCO. She's a graduate of the University of Maryland and Harvard University. She's the first woman and the first Eastern European to lead the organization. She's a leading champion of gender equity, of quality education for all, and more recently she's become the international spokesperson for the campaign to stop illicit traffic of cultural goods, and of course in her role oversees the convention and the World Heritage Sites operations in the world. But I just want to mention something personal on the first time I ever met Irena. And I was the executive director for the United Nations World Food Program. I was in Pakistan on the front lines of epic flooding in September 2nd, 2010 was the day we met. Uh, one fifth of Pakistan, and in particular the Indus Valley, were underwater, one fifth of the landmass of Pakistan, and 75% of the population was viewed as food insecure due to the, the effects of the flooding. 
And for the first time <coughs> in my experience, a UN agency not really seen on the front lines of human disaster zones, typically, the new head, Irena Bakova, showed up. And she talked about the incredible uh, monuments and heritage sites are in the Indus Valley and the threat to them and immediately met with the Prime Minister and his team to make sure efforts were being put in place to protect those. So I knew from that moment she's a woman of action. I knew from that moment we should watch this space. And so um, in all of her roles, including as Foreign Minister of Bulgaria and in other roles, including this one, she has been a leading advocate and an outspoken advocate of human rights, diversity, and human dignity. Irena, we're so pleased to have you here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Josette. Uh, thank you for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, I'm particularly grateful uh, to hear that uh, from a colleague, uh, from a friend also, and uh, uh, I would say another passionate uh, advocate of multilateralism and uh, what the United Nations can do uh, in protecting heritage and uh, protecting human lives at the same time. I think uh, we should always uh, speak about both. And let me also uh, say, uh, uh, here in the presence of uh, so many dignitaries, uh, and I would say uh, friends of UNESCO, the, His Excellency uh, Dr. Ibrahim Al Jafari, Foreign Minister of Iraq, uh, uh, Mr. Nasser Judeh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Sameh Hassan Shukri, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, uh, uh, Her Excellency Julie Bishop, Foreign Minister of Australia, uh, and of course, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the Honorable Kevin Root, uh, President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, uh, uh, Deborah Lair, uh, another passionate also uh, defender uh, for, from the Antiquities Coalition for protecting of heritage, uh, uh, the Middle, the Near Eastern Institute, and so many friends also from the civil society and uh, academia. Um, I think, uh, Josette, you mentioned that it is an urgent meeting, and I cannot but agree with you, because the United Nations uh, tomorrow is taking up a historic moment of adopting a sustainable development agenda. And we are thinking about what the world will be in the next 15 years. And I don't imagine the world in the next 15 years with these precious antiquities, with everything that our ancestors and humanity, different cultures, have left to us. And that is why I think it is so timely that a day before this big historic gathering, we are here together to talk an issue which is, I believe, at the heart of peace and security. Just very recently, a few weeks ago, we met with most of the ministers in Paris for the conference on victim of attacks and abuses on ethnic and religious grounds in the Middle East co-organized by the Foreign uh, Minister Nasser Judeh and French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius. We met in Cairo before, in mid-May, for the regional conference on cultural property under threat, the cultural and security impact of antiquities theft, spearheaded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, the Ministry of Antiquities and Antiquities Coalition. This was an important moment to scale up regional cooperation, so much in need in the fight against illicit trafficking. I think all these initiatives, yeah, I may add also the very important Jordanian initiative about youth and peace and security, and the important uh, area format in the Security Council meeting, and of course the conference that was organized uh, end of August uh, uh, with the active participation of uh, His uh, Highness, uh, the Crown Prince. And I think it is very important because culture indeed is under attack today like never before. Last month, on 13 August, the Temple of Bell in Palmyra, a UNESCO World Heritage Site was destroyed by explosives. The temple was a symbol of millennial dialogue between cultures. And this is why I believe it was destroyed. The challenge we face today is sustained barbaric, systematic destruction and looting of antiquities. This is what I called a couple of months ago cultural cleansing. 
a war crime. Cultural cleansing is a strategy to spread hatred, to eradicate cultural identities and makers, to deepen sectarian violence. The Museum of Mosul has been vandalized. Parts of ancient Hatra have been bulldozed. Nimrud has been dynamited. The Umayyad Mosque in Aleppo has become a battlefield. In Iraq, two of the four UNESCO World Heritage Sites have been destroyed, Hatra and Ashur, as well as at least nine other important historic sites. In Syria, all six UNESCO World Heritage Sites have been damaged by fighting. Eight sites on the World Heritage tentative list have been damaged, destroyed, or impacted by looting and illegal excavations. Across the region, illegal archaeological excavations have taken on industrial scale, financing violent extremism. Culture has always been the victim of war, but what we see today is new, new in scale and in nature. Because we do believe that attack attacks against heritage and culture are, in fact, attacks against people, against their identities, against their human rights. They are attacks against the humanity we all share. And I would really like to th thank you once again, Josette, for your so inspiring, uh, I would say, words at the beginning of this incredible history and heritage that we all share, and that belongs not to one particular community, not even to one people, but to all of us here. And I think nowadays we can say that fundamentally the, these attacks are attacks against peace. They undermine grounds for reconciliation. They fuel violent extremism taken forward through a global media campaign. And this is why I do believe that cultural cleansing is no longer only a cultural emergency. It is a security issue and a peace-building imperative. This is why, more than ever before, we must stand together to protect cultural heritage and combat illicit trafficking of cultural property. The UNESCO's message, I think, has been quite clear. It is at the heart of all of UNESCO cultural conventions. Of course, the World Heritage Convention adopted in 72, which I believe was so much inspired by the big campaign to save the Nubian temples. And that is why Egypt mm -hmm. stays at the heart of, of this quest for protecting of heritage. And also, this year, when we celebrate the 70th anniversary of UNESCO, this message has never been so important. In fact, this is why I went to Iraq twice in the last 10 months. I went to Baghdad, I went to Erbil last uh, November to hand over the World Heritage Certificate for the citadel in Erbil. And then I returned end of March to stand with your government, Mr. Minister, and the people of Iraq for national unity, reconciliation, and protecting your heritage, marvelous heritage. This February, the United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 2199 for which we have been working very actively with the Security Council, banning the trade of antiquities from Syria to curb financing for violent extremist groups. UNESCO has been tasked to assist member states in implementing this groundbreaking resolution. And I have brought together all our relevant partners, Interpol, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, the World Customs Organization, UNIDRA, the International Council of Museums, International Council of Sites and Monuments, uh, ICROM, for a stronger action and coordination to create a joint platform for action. Moving forward requires enhancing coordination among law enforcement agencies, experts, museum auction houses, strengthening legal frameworks, awareness raising, capacity building. And I do believe that implementation already is bearing fruit. Many member states, I would say dozens already of member states, are adjusting and strengthening legislation, capacity building, training have started, and I'm determined to continue. I was just recently, last week I was in Brussels, and I was pleading strongly with the European Union because some of the 
countries of the European, members of the European Union are the traditional big markets of art. And I was pleading with the European Union to take stronger action, to harmonize layer legislation, to strengthen also the all the regime of the imports, importation of cultural goods. And I, I think the European Union, the European Parliament are moving very strongly also in this uh, in this area. And uh, I the fight, of course, uh, somebody would ask why we, we consider the fight against illicit trafficking is so important. I think this is one of the most urgent actions that we have to say, to, to, to do nowadays. Of course, we have the legal basis, we have the 45 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict uh, during the World Heritage Committee meeting in Bonn. We launched a global coalition for the protection of cultural heritage. And what is most important, I think these crimes should not be left unpunished. And that is why we are reaching out to the International Criminal Court to ensure those who destroy heritage are brought to justice for war crimes. We need, of course, more intelligence sharing, satellite imagery, stronger cooperation. Working with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research Operational Satellite Application Program, UNOSAT, to monitor heritage through satellites in Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen. And I think it is an important work that we are doing. I think also that we have to counter this propaganda of, of uh, hatred. That is why, while being in Baghdad, I went in, uh, to the University of Baghdad, where with young people, we launched the Unite for Heritage campaign to engage young people in sharing messages of respect for cultural diversity to counter the narrative of violence and hatred, something that we discussed recently also during the Amman conference. And I'm very grateful to many of our partners. Antiquity Coalition was one of the first to join this global campaign. Thank you very much, Deborah. Engaging, it's a huge success to see these young people who care about uh, protecting heritage and who care about maintaining cultural diversity in the Middle East. And I know that sometimes we feel helpless. Sometimes we feel that we should do more. And what can we do when we see war, conflict, raging over the region. But let me just mention that in Bosra, in Idlib, in Syria, local parties, encouraged strongly by UNESCO, negotiated special agreements to respect the World Heritage property and the local museum in the name of common values shared by all. Even now, I think we should not be relentless in trying to plant the seeds of peace through local actions focused on culture and heritage. And this is why I think it is so important that we forge these broad coalitions like what we do today. And I think this is the call to action to protect the world heritage that we are hearing in so many of these important gatherings. So once again, let me express my deep conviction that culture today is on the front line of conflict. And it also should be at the heart of all the security, humanitarian, and peace building measures. This is UNESCO's determination. And I believe this is the spirit of our gathering today. So now, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we spoke about Palmyra. I visited Palmyra before the conflict. I was one of those lucky, probably, last people, persons to visit this incredible site, the Venice in the desert, as it was called, an oasis, a mirage in the desert, that was an embodiment of the dialogue among cultures, seeing the Greco-Roman elements influenced by the Persian culture with the Asian from the Mughals and the local, a local culture that was emerging. And I think this is precisely what extremists did not want to protect, to live, to stay in the world. And I was accompanied by a great archaeologist in person, Dr. Khaled Al-Assad, who was a great friend of UNESCO. He was the one who ensured the inscription of Palmyra on the World Heritage List in 1984. And this was one of the most heinous crimes 
that extremists did, because torture, he didn't tell them, where some of those movable objects were put in a place to hide them from the extremists to protect them. And it was an awful crime that they committed in Palmyra itself. I would like to invite you to have a minute of silence in his honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Irena, thank you very much. And it reminds us of the courage and bravery and determination and leadership required, I think, to protect these heritage sites. At this time, we're going to move to a very important discussion with the foreign ministers present here today. Uh, led by the Honorable Kevin Rudd, the inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and he took that office in January 2015. Before this, he served as Prime Minister of Australia and as Foreign Minister. Uh, in his positions of leadership, he's really demonstrated that he's one of the world's great doers and also one of the world's great problem solvers. Um, he led Australia's response during the global financial crisis, making it the only major developed economy not to go into reception, uh, into recession, and helped found the G20 and helped inspire APEC um, and many other accomplishments. Uh, he's the only Western head of state, I believe, to sit in that position um, and speak fluent Mandarin and to the worry of all foreign ministries to conduct his own negotiations directly in Mandarin. Um, <laughs> And he's just finished a major uh, and seminal research project at Harvard University on alternative futures for U.S.-China relations, which um, is a project that we've taken on here with him. But I would also like to say on a personal level, I have seen that he's a great humanitarian. Uh, from his bold and historic initiative to offer an apology to the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, to the work I saw on the front lines of famine around the world, including in Somalia, where he helped lead global response uh, during my tenure as head of the World Food Program, to helping really lead an effort to reform humanitarian mechanisms in the world, very technical, but very critical to saving lives, making them more efficient and effective, and accomplishing that through um, really building a coalition through action at home in Australia and helping to spread around the world. Um, Kevin, we're thrilled you could be here. Before you start, we're going to leave the head and invite the foreign ministers up to the head table here. So we'll switch seats now, and they'll join you, and then we'll begin this segment. Thank you. I'm relaxed. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and thank you for playing musical chairs. The, um, I did not know uh, Khalid al-Assad. I did not know him. But every now and then, just every now and then, in the flood of images we see every day in the world, 
There's something that just causes you to stop. And for me, amidst the sea of human misery that we have seen unfold in the countries represented by distinguished foreign ministers here present in the Middle East, the brutal murder uh, of Khalid al-Assad left me and I think the international community and the peoples of the world absolutely speechless. Here we had a scholar. Here we had a humanitarian. Here we had a person who dedicated his life to the preservation of our common heritage. And then in this moment where he became vulnerable in the hands of those who are definitionally evil, uh, he was slaughtered. Uh, he has truly become a martyr for our common cultural heritage. And he lives as an inspiration to us all. And not knowing him, but I think that if he were with us now, would call us to arms about what we do next. Uh, we are here to listen to these distinguished foreign ministers who, who come from concerned and committed countries around uh, this region and beyond. I think one of the easiest things that can happen as we uh, observe what's unfolding uh, across the Middle East, and in these countries in particular, is we become numbed by images in general. And we almost acquire a certain level of learned helplessness. What can we do? I think what we can do um, is combine to join our voice and to plan common causes of action. Of course, when we face evil, as we do, as we face Daesh, in all of its dimensions, it should be named as evil. Uh, and then we look at what we do in response to evil. And I look at these foreign ministers here present uh, from the region, and between them, um, the sheer volume, the sheer number of refugees, the sheer uh, size of the uh, casualties, those who have been killed in the course of this con conflict, stand in our minds first and foremost. In Syria alone, nearly 200,000 dead. Across uh, these countries, some four million refugees. Um, in my, friend, uh, in, uh, my friends in Jordan and in Lebanon, millions and millions of refugees. And so the human consequences, the, the human tragedy that we see before us must command our first responsibility. Our other responsibility uh, is when we see not just the murder of people, but also the murder of cultures. And Irena, I'm taken by your words uh, deeply when you speak of cultural cleansing. It's actually right that to use those terms. We need language which galvanizes the human family to action, and I commend you uh, for your leadership on that. We here at the Asia Society uh, really have two missions in life. Um, one is as follows. We like to see ourselves as the bridge builders between East and West, and we've been doing that for 60 years. But there's a second tradition we have as well, which is we like to see ourselves as the problem solvers or helping to solve problems. And we have a massive problem and challenge before us. Uh, we are humbled by the presence of so many people who are friends of not this institution only, but friends and partners in the challenge before us, which is taking practical steps to preserve our common civilization and global culture. And so the practical question we therefore have this morning as we listen to these uh, foreign ministers and we proceed through the events of the day is as follows. Number one, what can we do to strengthen the fabric of existing international law to maximize the protection of our common cultural heritage. Is the common current fabric of law sufficient or not? What does it do for actors within states? Um, what does it do and what does it say to those who are engaged in the destruction of property, not presently captured by the thinking of international heritage law some decades ago? Because the simple proposition, as Irana again said before, is no one responsible for cultural destruction 
should be left unpunished. They must know that there is a long arm of the international legal machinery which will one day get them and bring them to account, as we do for those who murder people. The second question um, is, um, what do we do in practical terms to help resource those countries who need assistance and support in protecting that which has not been destroyed but which is still in danger? For me, these are the two core questions we are left with this morning. And I know UNESCO has the responsibility and is exercising global, global leadership in these domains. I commend its work, but I think the voice, the strong voice and united voice of foreign ministers and governments around the world is necessary as well. With those remarks, uh, I would like very much to welcome our panelists this morning. Uh, we will begin today uh, with um, a presentation from uh, a number of uh, foreign ministers. I understand my good friend and colleague, uh, the foreign minister of Egypt, um, has soon to depart. And uh, with the indulgence of our other foreign ministers, I will ask him to make his remarks first. Excellency. Thank you so much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I'd like to, uh, at the outset, thank the Asian Society for organizing this uh, important meeting. Uh, I believe a proper understanding of uh, terrorism provides a fitting start to our gathering here today. The terrorist and terrorist organizations we confront are deeply ideological, ideological and show no respect for religion, culture, heritage, or civilization. They use their violent ideology to propagate their message, recruit fighters, and leg legitimize their criminal acts, including destruction of human heritage and cultural cleansing. All terrorist groups share the same extremist ideological framework, whether it's Daesh, Boko Haram, Ansar al-Sharia, Al-Qaeda, among others, all seek to establish a universal religious state according to their twisted interpretation of Islam. They use the destruction of cultural heritage as a tactic of war to terrify populations, to finance terrorist activities, and to spread hatred. The theft and sale of ancient artifacts imperils our shared heritage and funds terrorists seeking to destroy modern society. The rise of ISIL or Daesh has led to a marked increase in the theft and illegal sale of antiquities across the Middle East and North Africa. ISIL advances in Libya threaten major UNESCO heritage sites, including one of the world's best preserved Roman cities, Leptis Magna. Therefore, Egypt is working alongside regional international partners, such as the Antiquities Coalition, to stem the, fl the flow of uh, stolen antiquities. Earlier this year, Egypt hosted the Culture Under Threat conference in Cairo, bringing together UNESCO, as well as 10 nations from the Middle East and North Africa, to address the growing destruction, looting, trafficking of antiquities across the Middle East. Egypt is developing and implementing solutions, whether political or diplomatic, and security to preserve its own cultural heritage as well as help protect antiquities across the Arab world. The responsibility to confront, confront these terrorist criminal acts lies with the international community, including governments, international and regional organizations, museums, the art market, archaeologists, media, and all others who are interested in preserving this heritage for humanity. We look to our partners in the battle to protect the world's cultural heritage, to provide those states at the forefront of this fight with the support and assistance they very much need. In the end, Egypt will continue exerting the efforts to explore ways to prevent antiquities, finance terrorism, and protect our archaeological treasures. Egypt is on the front line of this battle, and only a united global effort can stop the illegal trade of stolen artifacts and defeat terrorists who profit from erasing our history. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for um, those uh, remarks. If I could now turn to my good friend, the Foreign Minister of Jordan, uh, Nasser Judah, for his contribution to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, um, my dear friend Kevin. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, organizing this, um, this event. Um, and I don't want to, uh, uh, to repeat, but sincere uh, gratitude and thanks to the Antiquities um, Coalition, Asia Society, Middle East Institute, UNESCO, um, and to you, Kevin, for uh, putting this um, uh, together. I think this is extremely timely and, uh, and important. I, um, 
I cannot, but I agree fully um, um, with what uh, uh, my um, uh, learned and good friend uh, Samah Shukri uh, said in outlining the, uh, the problem and uh, how we should effectively uh, deal with it. Um, it's uh, very, very important for all of us to be in partnership um, uh, to um, try and address this um, uh, most um, uh, terrifying of uh, developments um, in, in the conflicts that we see in our part of the world. I just on the way here, I spoke to um, uh, my son, who's in his um, third year um, of university in Edinburgh, Scotland, studying ancient Mediterranean civilization. And I said, I'm on my way to um, uh, to um, uh, to this function at the Age Society. Um, wh what's your feeling on what um, uh, what's happening with uh, with the cultural heritage and the destruction of what belongs to humanity? And you know, he just answered me with one sentence, which I was very impressed uh, by. He said, these terrorists are just intimidated by history. Um, um, because history delegitimizes de them. Um, and so I said, well, thank you very much. You've just given me my opening. Um, and, and he said, well, I'm honored that you asked me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is true. Um, history delegitimizes them. Uh, and therefore, in order for them to try and claim some sort of um, uh, legitimacy, they have to destroy um, history and destroy uh, what history uh, represents. And um, again, uh, cultural heritage, uh, needless to say, is a wealth uh, for all nations and cannot be preserved and protected without the consolidated effort of the international community as a whole. And I'll come back to the international community uh, and what it means. And of course, um, it requires the involvement of relevant agencies, organizations, NGOs, um, business communities, as um, um, Minister Samet um, said, even the, the art market um, itself has to uh, be uh, involved because we really have to um, literally uh, shut down all their sources of financing and all their potential sources for profit making from illicit trafficking. It is only through establishing regional and interregional cooperation, international cooperation, and developing policy measures and actions that our efforts uh, collectively can fight the scourge of this um, uh, illicit trafficking of antiquities and protect the world's most uh, valuable cultural heritage. I Perhaps I could approach this from a different um, angle and say, we're facing um, um, evil of um, uh, unprecedented um, uh, proportions. This is not your usual um, uh, criminal organization or your usual um, uh, terrorist um, uh, group. Um, Daesh um, has, uh, with its evil ideology, uh, has access to, to funds, the likes of which we've never um, uh, seen uh, before, access to uh, territory, uh, vast territory at that, access to um, weapons, um, and of course access to cultural um, and archaeological uh, and, and historic um, sites that represent um, the wealth of, um, of um, um, uh, culture and heritage to, uh, to all of us. Um, and we have to fight it in a different way. When we say it's unprecedented, it means that we have to approach this uh, in an unprecedented uh, uh, way, and we have to fight it effectively. Um, our collective and shared responsibility as, as an international community. And let's go back to um, what I wanted to say earlier. International community, I mean, we, we use it in the singular. We say the international communities, not several, not several international communities. We are the international community. And therefore, the international community has to deal with this problem united um, in one effective way as one single um, entity. Otherwise, if we're going to have different approaches, then we might as well not call it an international community and just say we are several, several countries or several members of the international community, each doing its own thing, and therefore um, um, really having an ineffective approach to a problem that is um, uh, developing and being augmented uh, almost on a daily um, uh, basis. So our abhorrence for what's happening, our disgust with what's happening, um, our a serious alarm uh, at um, um, the, the threat uh, facing our common and shared history and, and, and cultural um, um, heritage um, should require us all to move um, as one. We can't have exceptions. Everybody has to be um, on board. It's a, it's a zero tolerance um, approach uh, that requires zero tolerance for those who, who, who simply don't, don't believe in what we're saying, in my opinion. Today's Today's problem, whether um, in Syria or um, in Iraq and the destruction that we have um, uh, seen, also uh, means that we have to look at uh, 
the whole picture. We have to have a holistic approach. We have to find political solutions for the crises and for the conflicts in the region. The root causes, search for the root causes, what causes radicalization, how do we effectively combat radicalization, not just the military, which is very important, not just the, the discussion on global uh, region and global uh, security, also an ideological war, but also a, a, a cultural uh, a war which we have, uh, which we have to uh, win. So we have to have uh, political solutions. Today's main focus, of course, uh, is the uh, rejection and the total disgust attacks um, against um, um, significant archaeological cultural sites which are falling victim to the conflicts, not just in our region but uh, beyond. We are five years, almost five years into the Syrian conflict. W what is five years? It's negligible uh, when you're talking about uh, the Temple of Bel, 2,000 years uh, old. But five years is nothing. Um, and um, Again, the targets of these, um, and I try to avoid calling them extremists because they enjoy being called extremists. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not insulting them by calling them extremists. Uh, they want to be called extremists because all of us, to them, are you know, moderates, and moderation in their eyes means weakness. Um, and, and it is much better to call them for what they really are. They're evil, murderers, criminals. Uh, that's what they are. They are, as we say in, uh, in Jordan, His Majesty the King says, Khawarij, they are outlaws, renegades. Um, from uh, from uh, um, uh, Islam and everything that Islam as a noble uh, religion um, uh, stands for. And their first targets are uh, Muslims, by the way. And they target Muslim um, uh, history and Muslim heritage before they target um, uh, anything else that is shared um, uh, by, by all of us. And even Muslim and Islamic heritage in our part of the world is shared by uh, the world at large. There is a site, and um, Madame Bokova knows the site well, and I mentioned it in the conference in Paris, uh, called uh, Umm Rasas, which is south of uh, Amman um, in Jordan. Um, it is a site where 16 churches were built um, in, during the glorious years of the Umayyad uh, Caliphate. Uh, they were built uh, and preserved and protected and were um, frequented by worshippers from different denominations of, uh, of Christianity in the glorious years of the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, when you know, people would expect that Islam was trying to perhaps discourage the building of churches. On the contrary, they were encouraging the building of, uh, uh, of churches. To have um, such a, a collection of churches in one site during, like I said, the glorious years of the Umayyad Empire shows you exactly what Islam uh, uh, represents and how um, interfaith um, coexistence um, and peaceful coexistence between the different religions uh, was the order of the day um, uh, back then. Um, and, and this is something that the, 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 the evildoers don't like. And this is something that the evildoers want to obliterate from the pages of, uh, uh, of history. And they will not succeed. Um, the importance of cultural heritage and its preservation uh, is clearly expressed in the Charter um, of Fundamental Rights. Its preamble emphasizes our uh, shared responsibility towards future generations and establishes the right of um, uh, citizens to information, education, and cultural heritage, as well as the rights of national and ethnic minorities. Um, furthermore, international conventions that um, guide uh, the preservation of heritage demand um, uniform application of adherence. Again, I, like I said, you can't have, um, you can't have um, exceptions. I don't want to um, um, uh, go on uh, too much. I know that uh, my distinguished uh, colleagues on the panel all have uh, um, um, value to add to this uh, discussion. But I just want to remind that we in Jordan have played uh, an instrumental part in, in the drafting and the adoption of uh, Security Council Resolution 2199, which condemns the destruction of cultural heritage and which um, um, also adopted uh, legally binding measures to counter illicit trafficking of antiquities and cultural objects from Iraq and Syria. We take this opportunity to encourage all member states to commit fully to the implementation of that resolution and all related um, uh, resolutions. Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, as we welcome the launch of the Global uh, Coalition, Unite for Heritage, um, and um, as we uh, support um, uh, the, uh, this initiative by um, uh, Director General um, uh, Bokova. Uh, I hope that this will help strengthen the mobilization of governments to face um, deliberate damage to cultural heritage, particularly in, um, in the Middle East. I mean, tens of thousands of looted antiquities have been retrieved by us in, um, uh, in Jordan over the years and placed in, in protected uh, warehouses and national legislation um, um, has been amended to place even more protection. Um, on antiquities, um, increasing the number of confiscation um, or cases of confiscation by, by the um, uh, authorities. Um, I just want to say that um, we, we really have to adopt the term used by 
um, uh, arena, cultural cleansing. And we, we, we have to start using it more and more. This is similar to um, ethnic uh, uh, cleansing, similar to all kinds of uh, um, religious cleansing. This is cultural cleansing par excellence. And we have to um, uh, really do something about, um, uh, uh, about having these effective national and international measures uh, to, uh, to stop this. Uh, we are, uh, I, I was happy in the area form, format um, uh, session at the Security Council that we had UNESCO and Interpol there, because I think these two tracks have to uh, work in parallel, but they have to converge um, um, at the same uh, time. We have to have a combination of the military uh, effort before, during, and after. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, if we know, um, I'm glad um, uh, Deborah said earlier, you have the foreign ministers here today, not the ministers of antiquities, and that's for a, for a purpose. Um, and I understand that, uh, that purpose uh, fully, but at some stage the discussion has to go across the board to the military as well. Because when we know that a, a, a cultural or a site of significance um, uh, in terms of the heritage is under threat uh, or immediate uh, threat, I should say, there has to be an act a preventive act to, um, by the military to, to, to stop the terrorists from, from getting there. As the sites are liberated, also we have to have uh, some, um, uh, some um, uh, effort to restore infrastructure and public services and policing and security uh, to these areas and to these uh, towns and to these sites that are liberated from uh, Daesh or any other um, uh, terrorists. So it is very important, like I said, to have a before, during, and after um, um, effort. I think it's enough that um, um, we have all these fantastic uh, uh, meetings, and they're all important, by the way. We had a meeting in Jordan, Egypt had a meeting, Paris had a, France had a meeting, and we should continue uh, highlighting this problem and should continue uh, to, to emphasize it. But I think uh, we have to go beyond alarm, shock, and condemnation. The time has come for us to unite towards a more proactive approach and translate words into deeds before it is uh, uh, too late. We are trustees. None of these sites around the world belong to an individual or to an individual country. We are trustees from one generation uh, to the next. And it is our duty and responsibility as trustees of this generation to do everything we can to resolve uh, this alarming issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nasser. And the Asia Society Haiku Award uh, of the month will go to Nasser El Judah um, uh, Jr. Uh, for his statement, <laughs> terrorists destroy culture because they are delegitimized by history. And so um, we will make sure he's properly recognized for what I think was an extraordinarily acute observation. Uh, now my um, a good friend and former parliamentary colleague, uh, Julie Bishop, Foreign Minister of Australia. Julie. Thank you, Kevin, ladies and gentlemen. In a world where violence, atrocities, destruction is tragically, increasingly commonplace. Australia was stunned by the brutal murder of Khalid al-Assad, and we are utterly appalled by the destruction of cultural property in the Middle East. Just as the Taliban destroyed the Buddha statues of Bamiyan, the barbaric terrorists, ISIS or Daesh, is systematically destroying treasured archaeological sites across Iraq and Syria, including Nimrud and Palmyra. Organised crime groups linked to Daesh and other terrorists are trafficking art and antiquities with the proceeds directly funding terrorist activities. There's an established link between extreme ideologies, such as that of Daesh, and the destruction and trafficking of antiquities. Back in 1951, American philosopher Eric Hoffer explored the psychological underpinnings of mass movements in his seminal work, The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements. Hoffer observed how fanatical mass movements break down existing group ties as part of their strategy to find new recruits. Destroying a group's heritage and history weakens traditional communal bonds, leaving individuals, quote, orphaned and empty in a cold world, which makes them ideal potential converts for a movement like Dash. In line with Hoffer's analysis, Dash is seeking to destroy 
any cultural belief system that competes with its violent narrative. Hence, Dash ransacks and destroys ancient sculptures and artefacts and burns priceless manuscripts that tie the people of the Middle East to their real and extraordinary histories. They do it because they want to draw people into their brutal movement. Dash has declared a caliphate, claiming to establish a pure form of government that will attract radicalised supporters willing to die for its cause. The deliberate destruction of cultural artefacts and antiquities is an abhorrent crime. Illicit trafficking of stolen antiquities poses a direct threat to the cultural heritage of the region, including in Iraq, Syria, Libya and Yemen, and hence the world. For cultural and archaeological sites are part of humanity's common heritage. We in Australia recognise that ours is an ancient land with an ancient people. We treasure our indigenous art, artefacts and sacred sites, which are not only the pre precious heritage of the Australian Aboriginal peoples, but which help explain who we are as a nation. The cultural property is subject to strong legal protections. So Australia strongly supports international efforts to prevent the illicit trade in cultural property, thereby shutting down a lucrative source of terrorist funding. Full and effective implementation of UN Security Council resolutions and international agreements on the protection of cultural property is a cornerstone of combating international antiquities trafficking. Australia welcomes UNESCO's leadership on this issue. We believe governments have a key role to play. All member states must play their part, including through full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2199, which condemned the destruction of cultural heritage in Iraq and Syria and called on all states to prevent the trade in cultural property removed illegally from these countries. Australia is taking action to support these efforts. We have recently drafted sanctions regulations implementing our obligations under Security Council Resolution 2199, which will come into effect on the 15th of October this year. Australia has a domestic legal framework for the protection of foreign cultural property. We will ensure that this framework fully implements our international obligations. We are training our law enforcement officers and our customs officials specifically to protect cultural heritage and antiquities. We use sanctions as an important tool to prevent terrorists accessing income generated by the illicit trafficking of cultural property. All countries, but particularly transit and destination countries, must ensure their trade controls on cultural property are sufficiently strong to identify and recover trafficked antiquities. Our international crime cooperation frameworks, including extradition and mutual legal assistance, need to be as broad as possible to facilitate investigations and prosecutions. Combating the illicit trafficking in antiquities is a key part of our collective efforts to combat terrorism. The Middle East is one of the cradles of human civilization. The wanton destruction of cultural treasures in Syria and Iraq is eliminating our links with centuries, even millennia, of human history. It is an attack on the very essence of humankind. It is our shared duty to stop these attacks and protect our common heritage. We welcome this summit to discuss this exceedingly important issue. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks very much, um, Julie. Uh, Foreign Minister of Australia. Um, as uh, we prepare for our next speaker and last speaker in the panel, um, His Excellency uh, Foreign Minister Jafari of, um, of uh, Iraq, uh, His Excellency will be speaking in Arabic. Uh, you have devices in front of you, and uh, I'll give you uh, a, f a few seconds to prepare yourselves uh, with your... Um, uh, earphones. But um, Foreign Minister Bishop, thank you for reminding us of three things. Uh, Hoffa's reminder uh, to us all about the objective 
of terrorists and murderers, which is to actually disconnect uh, current peoples from uh, the cultural bond which they share uh, across history. Secondly, the centrality of finance uh, derived from the illegal sale of cultural artefacts to terrorist organisations. And thirdly, the importance of domestic legislation in all of our countries to ensure that the protection of foreign cultural artefacts and their sale within any of our own domestic uh, legal regimes is outlawed. And I thank you for your contribution. Uh, your Excellency, um, Foreign Minister Jafari of uh, Iraq, uh, we welcome your contribution. And on Channel 1. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah, Sayyid al-Rais, Ashab al-Ma'ali, Sayyidat al-Sada, Assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullah. Ismahu li, bidayatan, an ataqaddam biwafir shukr wa azim al-imtinan لمن ساهم وعدوا لهذا المنتدى الرفيع المستوى سيما منظمة المجتمع الآسيوي ومعهد الشرق الأوسط واليونسكو وتحالف الآثار وللذين ساهموا في إعداده لتعريف العالم بجرائم الإرهاب العالمي تجاه آثارنا وقيمنا الحضارية والثقافية لا يفوتني ابتداء أن أرحب وأثمن جهود منظمة اليونسكو وجهود يمينها العام السيدة رينا موكوفا على الدعم الكبير والتوعية العالمية بجريمة تدمير آثار العراق وواصل الشكر إلى الدول التي وقفت مع العراق وساعدته في جهوده من أجل استعادة الآثار العراقية المنهوبة وعلى وجه الخصوص ما بدلته الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أم عنت النظر كثيرا في هذا العنوان عنوان الثقافة تحت التهديد ووجدت من الحكمة أن أفكك في مركبه في تصوري أن الإرهاب يستهدف الآن تحطيم الماضي من الحضارة والتاريخ وإلغاء الحاضر وتهديد المستقبل لذلك أنا أرحب وأبارك بابن السيد الوزير عندما قال له أن هؤلاء يعادون التاريخ طبعا الأمة التي تفقد تاريخها تفقد ذاكرتها والتالي لا تستطيع أن تواصل حركتها فضلا أن تستأنف هذه الحركة من جديد أن ما يتعرض له التراث الثقافي في العراق هو استهداف منابع الثقافة العالمية ليس غرورا وليس ادعاء أن العراق مهد الحضارة العالمية منذ ستة آلاف سنة وذاكرة العراق تختزن لكل الحضارات بالعالم أنها ولدت في منطقة وادي الرافدين وهؤلاء عندما يستهدفون يستهدفون العراق لأنهم يريدوا أن يجتثوا أصول الحضارة والإنسانية والثقافة وإشاعة روح الهمجية والاقتتال تبني المشاريع حان وقته بدلا من أننا نسمع بين فنة أخرى التنظيرات التنظيرات مهمة شريطة أن تتحول إلى مشاريع عمل شعبنا في العراق يلمس لمس اليد انتهاكات على الأرض ويقدم أولاده وبناته وأطفاله وكل إمكانياته يقدمهم ضحايا في العراق يجب أن يلمس شيء عمل جاد ورد فعل من قبل كل دول العالم ما دام الإرهاب يستهدفنا جميعا لابد أن يكون ردنا ردا يمثل يمثلنا جميعا ضد الإرهاب الإرهاب معولم متعدد الانتهاكات انتهاك للطفل وللمرأة وللشيخ والكبير والصغير والثروة والزرع والماء كل شيء منتهك من قبل الإرهاب متعدد الانتهاكات ومتعدد المناطق وليس عراقيا ولا أسيويا ولا أوروبيا هو معولم في كل العالم لذلك يجب أن تتعدد ردودنا كلها تنتظم حول مكافحة هذا السرطان الوباء المعاصر الذي يستهدف تدمير تدمير العالم ما يتعرض إلى التراث إذن في العراق على يد عصابات داعش يستهدف المساجد المعابد من مساجد إلى كنائس إلى كل شيء يرتبط بعبادة الإنسان ونهب وتهريب التراث الثقافي بمختلف نوعه من مواقع أثرية متاحف مكتبات كل شيء بمثابة خزين للثقافة والمعرفة هو مستهدف من قبل داعش ولذلك الإصرار على تدمير الثقافة العالمية كونها تمثل تنوع الثقافة الإنسانية وأساس التعايش السلمي 
كل أثر من آثار الحضارة يمثل ينبوع مشترك إنساني وبالتالي تستهدفه داعش لتحطيم منابع الثقافة الإنسانية وهذه خسارة لا يمكن تعوضها بالنسبة للعراق وبالنسبة للبشرية جمعاء مما يقتضي التصدي لها من خلال تدابير فعالة وفقا لقرار مجلس الأمن المرقم 2199 أصبح عندنا مرتكز بالمشروعية الدولية لسنة 2015 والذي يلزم الدول الأعضاء بإعادة القطع الأثرية المسروقة في العراق كما أننا نعتقد أن الاستجابة الفعالة لتهريب الآثار والاتجار غير المشروع بها وحمايتها يستلزم العمل في المسارات الآتية مسار الأول منع الأطراف الوسيطة من نقل الممتلكات الثقافية من دول المصدر الضحية إلى دول الوصول عبر تجديد الإجراءات القانونية ومطالبة الوسطاء سيما دور البيع بالمزاد والمتاجرون دور دور البيع بالمزاد والمتاجرون بالتحف الفنية وجامعو الأعمال الفنية وخصائيو المتاحف بتقديم مستندات وشهادات المنشأ لمنع تهريب الممتلكات الثقافية العراقية. مسار الثاني أن التأطير القانوني للتعاون الإقليمي يعد أساس في منع تهريب الآثار من المناطق المحتلة من قبل كيان داعش الإرهابي لا سيما تعاون دول الجوار وتجديد الإجراءات في المنافذ الحدودية وأعجبني كثيرا مقولة الأخ أول ما بدأ الندوة سأل سؤالين محددين ماذا نفعل نحن بالقانون الدولي وما هي الخطوات العملية القانون ليس إنجيلا ولا توراة ولا قرآن قانون من وضع البشر ويمثل مستوى معين للبشر ويتطور القانون بتطور البشر وتجارب البشر لذلك من, من الخطأ أننا نعتبر أن بداية كل قانون سيبقى ثابتا كالصخر كالجبل كعمق المحيطات إلى الأبد قانون يتبدل ويتطور من هنا يجب أن نأخذ من القانون ما هو يواكب ونضيف إلى القانون ما ينبغي أن يواكب تطورات البشر مع هذه التطورات الأخيرة يجب أن نعيد النظر بالقوانين الموجودة ونعمل على جعلها تستجيب لتحقيق الأهداف الإنسانية المشروعة وبنفس الوقت تستجيب للتحديات الخطرة المسار الثاني التأطير القانوني التعاون الإقليمي يعد بالنسبة لنا تهريب من المناطق المحتلة من قبل كيان داعش لا سيما تعاون دول الجوار وهنا يبرز دور مساهمة الخبراء والقانونيين الدوليين لوضع السبل والطرق القانونية لحماية الآثار خاصة وأن العالم يشهد توسعا لهذه الأنشطة الإجرامية ومع إدراك الدول كافة لمسؤوليتها الأخلاقية والقانونية عن حماية الآثار كجزء من الإرث الحضاري المسار الثالث والأخير هو إعادة تقييم النظام القانوني الدولي الذي يحكم حماية الإرث البشري والثقافي بمختلف خصائصه الفريدة وذلك من خلال ما يلي تشجيع الدول على الاستثمار في عمليات المتابعة والرقابة الحثيثة للقطع والمواد الأثرية والثقافية المنهوبة أو المسروقة وعادتها إلى موطنها الأصلي أنا أعتقد هناك ثمة علاقة بين الأثر الحضاري والتراثي وبين حضارة ذلك البلد تماما كما هي النبتة عندما تجتث من أرض معي... أرضية زراعية معينة وتنقل إلى أرضية أخرى لا يمكن أن تعطي آثارها ونتائجها كما لو تكون أهرام مصر أنشئت في مصر لا تعطي أهرام مصر قيمتها الحقيقية إلا في أرض مصر مستوحاة من البيئة المصرية ومن التاريخ المصري وقل مثل ذلك قبلها الآثار العراقية في أهوار الأعمار والبصرة والناصرية إنها آثار تحكي وتعكس شعوريا ولا, شعور ولا شعوريا حضارة ذلك البلد وتطي إحاءات جديدة لكنها كلها مستوحات من تلك البيئة جعل الالتزامات الدولية القانونية أكثر تفصيلا بخصوص الحكم القانوني الذي تقدمه للقاضي الوطني تشجيع الدول على التوقيع والانضمام والتصديق على الاتفاقيات الدولية النافذة بخصوص حماية الآثار والإرث الثقافي والحضاري البشري وقد تكللت جهود العراق مع ألمانيا الاتحادية وبدعم من منظمة اليونسكو بإصدار قرار الجمعية العامة المرقم 281 بتاريخ 28-5-2015 والمعنون بإنقاذ تراث العراق الثقافي والذي أكد على ما يلي التأكيد على أهمية حماية التراث الثقافي الإنسانية أن الهجمات التي يقوم بها تنظيم داعش على التراث الثقافي جرائم حرب نصت الاتفاق 
اتفاقية على ذلك ثالثا أن حماية وصون التراث العالمي هي مسؤولية جميع الدول ورابعا التأكيد على ضرورة محاسبة مرتكبي تلك الجرائم ومنعهم من الإفلات من العقاب العادل وأخيرا أن التحدي الذي نواجهه الآن هو استرجاع القطع الأثرية المهربة وأصلاح ما دمر منها حفاظا على التراث العالمي الذي يجسد في الوقت ذاته هوية وتنوع حضارة وقيم المجتمع العراقي أه لا شك أن العالم يواجه اليوم أزمة حادة ومواجهة شرسة ومحيونة من قبل داعش كل الإجراءات القانونية يجب أن تتخذ كل جلساتنا يبقى أن تكون تعبق بحضور حقيقي وفعلي ونصرة الشعوب التي تضررت وهي ضحايا والعراق خط التماس الأول في هذه المواجهة يجب أن نشعر هؤلاء وأكرر ما قلته في أكثر من مؤتمر أنهم عندما يهددوا حرمة بلد لا يجدون شعبه فقط على الأرض يجدون شعبه ويجدون شعوب العالم كله تقف إلى جانب ذلك الشعب حذاري أن يتسرب لنا ثقافة اليأس هؤلاء مروا بالتاريخ في عدة محطات اندحروا واندثروا ونساهم التاريخ وبقيت الشعوب حية والمجتمعات حية شعوبنا ستنتصر وأن أخذت بعض الوقت شكرا جزيلا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله Thank you very much, Foreign Minister Jafari, uh, you for reminding us of the particular significance uh, of Iraq when it comes to the global challenge of protecting our common civilization. Wherever we have grown up in the world, we have all studied the wonders of ancient Mesopotamia, uh, ancient Sumer, ancient Babylonia, Ur of the Chaldees, Nineveh. And when any or each of these are challenged in any way, it affects us all in a particular way. We have about 30 minutes before us, and um, the discussion I would like to unfold is a practical one, which is uh, what, what in fact do we do next? Uh, and that, I believe, is the critical challenge which lies before us. Uh, I know Irena needs to leave about now, but I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask her to, to make one simple question which she leaves with the panel as she goes. Um, she's in the hot seat on all this around the world um, and, um, and doing so through the agency of UNESCO. For governments around the world, what is your number one ask right now to make your job easier in achieving the mission that you have? Um, Kevin, I think that um, number one, if we talk about the practical uh, action that governments have to take, definitely is what about ministers who are speaking. Illicit trafficking and financing of extremism, of terrorism. I think this is the way we will show them. We will cut the, I would say, the sources equally like oil and drugs and human <coughs> beings. Uh, uh, we have to take uh, all responsibility. And nation, it's, uh, it's about national governments. We, at the level of, uh, of agencies, of international partners, have established a broad platform of cooperation. On our site, on UNESCO, based on our conventions, based on the, uh, I would say, an incredible dedication of experts, of museum workers, of, uh, of many of the civil society, academia, and partners. We have received, we have uh, um, uh, requested uh, all member states of UNESCO to give us information of how they implement Resolution 2199. And I think Julie just uh, uh, was uh, uh, explaining so, so many things. One would think that all countries uh, have um, in their national legislation and institutions already well-established measures against illicit trafficking of art. And all of a sudden we discover that there is so much to be done, uh, so much to be done uh, in terms of uh, strengthening uh, importation, import regimes. Many countries have strong regimes and strong legislation in terms of export, protecting their own heritage. Yes. Uh, this is the case in many countries. Europe is a typical case in point, and the United States equally. Uh, very strong to protect, but not that strong in terms of imports. There is no much, not much harmonization an object coming in Europe, entering somewhere, and then moving around in and out of the European Union, going to Switzerland or somewhere, without harmonization of the legislation, it is so difficult to trace it. And this is where I, I mentioned I was in Brussels, we just discussed, and the European Union is moving very strongly in this. There is a legislation in the United Nations Congress also strengthening the imports. There are many countries 
they're taking. Um, I think creating uh, special units within police forces, making uh, Germany has launched a new initiative of how to coordinate the exchange information domestically among the police, the judicial authorities, the experts, the customs. One would say that everything is done in a country like Germany. They have launched their own initiative. So I think number one is, of course, nowadays is financing of terrorism and illicit trafficking of objects of art. Of course, all the rest is so important, raising the visibility, arguments why these extremists target heritage, uh, talking with young people, uh, radicalization, using once again heritage to educate them in terms of diversity, of mutual respect, of tolerance. These are very, very linked, I would say, uh, questions. Uh, and by, by doing this, uh, uh, and I was uh, really, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible, uh, uh, Judith, what your son said. Uh, it is just in, the, in three words he indeed captured uh, what, uh, what history means for this region uh, and for all of us. And working with, with young people, with local communities, all these campaigns are extremely important. We, as, uh, as admirers of heritage and people who know its impact, who know how much it is important for all of us, sometimes underestimate the need for making the link of local communities with their own heritage. And one thing, and I will end with this, I was immediately after the uh, changes the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Tunisia in 2011, uh, I went to Tunisia, we UNESCO, we organized the World Press Freedom Day in Tunisia, we worked a lot so that uh, the freedom of expression is inscribed in the constitution of uh, the new constitution of uh, Tunisia. And I went uh, to visit a school, just visited the Bordeaux Museum, who was brutally attacked also earlier, a couple of months ago. Uh, and I went to a school, a secondary school, and uh, I, I told the, the, the children, the students, I said, you know, you have an incredible heritage here. I just visited the Roman mosaics, which are maybe more beautiful than uh, the Italians have in Rome in, in some places. And I said, you should be proud of it. And the girl took uh, the floor and said, uh, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. You told me that I have to be proud of a culture that does not belong to me. This is not a culture that belongs to us, to the Tunisians. And I said, how much work we have to do if we want really to educate young people in diversity, in respect for different cultures, in having the ownership, because I told her this is part of your history, of the history of your people. This diversity, you should be proud of this diversity. It is the richness of Tunisia. So I thought how much work we still have to do in order to pass this strong message. Thank you so much, Irena. Your core points being uh, trafficking in cultural objects, the existence or otherwise of domestic legal frameworks to give effect to the relevant um, resolution, and enforcement. Julie, you've made some comments on that so far, and then to NASA to add to the conversation. Um, thank you, Irene. Kevin, I just wanted to perhaps come down to a practical level. Um, clearly, we need a well-coordinated international response, um, which will involve cooperation and input across all of the relevant uh, international agencies. Can you just bring that a little bit. Sorry, yeah. the UN Security Council, uh, UNESCO, the International Council of Museums, Interpol, uh, many others. So we need a very a full and effective implementation by governments of relevant sanctions, resolutions, and international agreements. Um, Australia is a party to two conventions, the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Cultural Property of 1970 and the Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict of 1954. I think it's time for all Member States to look anew at those two conventions and then review their domestic legal framework to ensure that they are enforcing the protection scheme as effectively as possible. Um, I also think that we need to more work more closely with museums and uh, global cultural organisations to ensure that the highest standards are being maintained in the safeguarding and acquisition of international cultural property, because this is on an unprecedented scale, this uh, targeting of cultural sites and pillaging and looting, you know, for example, Palmyra. Um, and also engaging with the private sector, the uh, the auction houses and the dealers uh, to raise an awareness of not only domestic law and their obligations, but also 
uh, the import and export of cultural material. So I think that there's um, more that we can do collectively in, in terms of the practical response to protecting the antiquities and the, and the um, cultural property once it has been trafficked or indeed trying to prevent the trafficking of it. As I turn to Nasser for comment, it's a practical question which arises from Julie's contribution just now, which is, uh, do we have a clear register internationally of those uh, member states and parties to the two conventions of 54 and 70 on uh, domestic um, law and enactment? Um, that is a practical question for us all, and I'm sure we'll come back to that during the course of the day. I know, Irani, you need to... You feel free to go whenever you need to. Nasser, Nasser, Prime Minister Nasser al uh, but, but You catch me at a disadvantage. I think we really have to research this and see exactly what... Um, this is very, very important that we, had, that we have. Uh, not just that, but I think um, uh, an international um, uh, listing of um, uh, sites and, and, and items uh, either lost or um, under immediate uh, um, uh, threat or in danger. I think we have to have all of that. And also uh, domestic, uh, not just domestic um, uh, legislation, but um, somehow maybe we can, um, we can replicate the exercise that, uh, that we all had uh, for nuclear security cooperation uh, to have an intelligence clearinghouse. Um, you know, where you, know, you, you, you have, literally you have a, a body that coordinates our international effort um, where intelligence sharing, uh, information gathering, uh, coordinated uh, um, um, effort to identify sites and items, uh, but also coordinate uh, action and reaction uh, in the future. I think it's very, very important for all of us to, uh, to coordinate that. But most, uh, most importantly, I think, is that um, Resolution 2199, Really, it is uh, incumbent upon all of us to ensure that it is uh, implemented and adhered to with zero tolerance for those who don't. Uh, I, I, I keep emphasizing that. Um, that's on the, on, on the one hand. And if you look at the resolution itself, I think we should also criminalize um, in, in the toughest to possible way those who are at the receiving end of uh, cultural and um, 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 uh, ar artifacts and, and, um, uh, and other uh, items. I mean, if you engage... Even with go-betweens, with middlemen, so to speak, um, and you're at the receiving end and you buy or purchase um, uh, the, these items, you're just as much a criminal uh, as, as those who sold it in the first place. So I think it's very, very important for all of us to criminalize those who interact with, uh, with the terrorists. Thank you uh, for those remarks. Um, uh, Ibrahim uh, Al-Jafari. على ضرورة استخدام القانون في منع أو على الأقل الحد من السطو على التراث والأذ كلكم تعلمون جيدا أن المخدرات في العالم محرمة دوليا الذي حد من نشر المخدرات واستخدام المخدرات كالإثيون والأوبيا وكل أنواع المخدرات هو ليس الضرر الطبي فقط الذي يزرع المخدر والذي يشتري المخدر والذي ينقل المخدر والذي يبيع المخدر والذي يستعمل المخدر كلهم يدرون مخاطر المخدرات الذي منعهم هو القانون القانون الصارم القانون لا ينتظر المواطن متى يرتقي إلى مستوى أنه يعي خطورة المخدر نزل بقوة وحد من الاستعمال أنا أعتقد نقل العينات التراثية من بلد إلى بلد ظاهرة خطيرة جدا تحد تهدد ثقافة العالم وإرجاع هذه المنتوجات الحضارية والمفاعلات التاريخية إلى مكانها الحقيقي وتحفظ لنا أمانة المنتجات التاريخية للحضارة وتشوه هذه لذلك يجب أن نشدد على صرامة القانون وأن تكون الدول خصوصا أنه الدول اللي هي كل دول العالم عضو بالأمم المتحدة كلها ساهمت في هذه الحالة يجب أن تتخذ موقفا صارما أزاء كل خرق بيع وشراء وترويج هذه العينات وإرجاعها إلى بلدانها الحقيقية Thank you so much um, for um, that contribution to our conversation. Deborah, uh, let me throw you into this conversation. You've heard uh, comments so far about the adequacy of the legal framework as it exists before we choose to add to it. Secondly, the adequacy of d domestic legislative um, action. And thirdly, police enforcement. Uh, you are deeply engaged uh, in this field. Please uh, add to our conversation. And again, if you were IRENA or those responsible for the international 
uh, jurisdiction concerning the protection of cultural heritage. If you had an opportunity to say to the governments of the world, what do you need to do more on enforcement or beyond that, what would it be? Well, I think the Deputy Prime Minister of Jordan really hit the nail on the head when he mentioned that this is a gathering on the subject of culture, but we have foreign ministries at the table. Because the most important issue here is to show that there's the political will to address this issue and that we're looking at this not just as an issue that archaeologists, if they do a better job, can solve, but it really requires different parts of governments in the international community coming together. And so the fact that we have foreign ministries, we have foreign ministers attending, but we have representatives from a number of other countries, with Italy, Qatar, Cambodia, Thailand, and on coming during this very busy week to show that this is a very serious issue that needs to be addressed. First, the political will to try and get things done. And this meeting really is the beginning of a series that will take place over the next few days, including one at the United Nations looking at potential solutions. And the second part of it then is, how can governments work to bring together diverse groups that are necessary for the kinds of solutions that we're looking for? Because it really does, in many ways, need to be under those umbrellas to gather in the various players from the military to the police units to the intelligence agencies who are tracking terrorist activity and the funding, then to the archaeologists and the arts community and others to explore what the solutions are. We're really hoping that after this session, when we've heard these really excellent presentations from the various foreign ministries and the goals that they have, that we can start a conversation around a series of solutions and be thinking very creatively about what the singular international community, meaning all of us in this room, can be doing to help these various governments during this time of crisis. Thank you for that uh, contribution uh, as well. Again, on the question of the adequacy of our international legal regime here, um, we've spoken just now about the importance of having foreign ministers engaged on this question. Um, and of course, the intersection which Julie Bishop and others have pointed to between foreign ministers and domestic law enforcement agencies. And we heard that before, I think, Irena speak to the specific example of our friends in Germany establishing specialist capabilities uh, within the police services. I'll be interested in comments, uh, either from yourself or from others around the table, about what needs to be done in that domain as well. Um, I'm not sure what the practice is in Australia, uh, but when I look at other jurisdictions in the world and have spoken to police services about this, they will all throw their hands up in horror and say we have a thousand other things to do. Um, so the question is, if this is of a national and international priority, how do we marshal the resources, uh, in fact, to do this? Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, inviting my country at this uh, event. Of course, we are very interested in it. Well, maybe I can reply and say that in 1969, Italy became the first country to create a police division specialized in protection of cultural heritage. Um, because it's true what the son of the German foreign minister said that the, um, the terrorists are uh, intimidated by history, but they are also very interested in money. And basically what is uh, happening in, um, in Palmyra, it's not only a destruction of our cultural heritage, but also a, um, a booming of illicit traffic of uh, uh, artistic artifacts. Uh, and this is the real, really the problem, because um, until they have the connection among money and uh, illegal uh, artistic artifacts, uh, we will see a lot of this so-called destruction. Because also, the destruction that we are moving, and they are very appealing, they destruct, they destroy something, but actually they export a lot of other issues. And this is where really you have to, to fight on this. We have a long, uh, long standing tradition starting in 1969. Um, it's a um, very high level of expertise also because, um, as you know, um, the world is full of Italian artistic artifact not always legally uh, uh, acquired, not always uh, uh, legally uh, in the, the hand of the legal uh, owners of this. Um, and so building on this experience, we are very active, uh, both on political and technical level, to, 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 to sharing this, this experience uh, uh, with us. 
Um, allow me to underline just two points. First, um, our first national action is uh, um, expressed in uh, the UNESCO quarter, and of course we, we appreciate the direct general of participation in New York and the Assembly. And in UNESCO, Italy and Spain in April, the UNESCO executive board adopted the resolution 196 on cultures in area of conflict. The resolution underlies the major damage of the cultural heritage humanity and war and uh, um, the possibility to um, create some specific uh, uh, blue helmet to protect uh, or to uh, going uh, against this one. Um, and also, I would like to, 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 to stress that currently Italy is the vice president of the Assembly of the City Party of International Criminal Court. And this is one issue that has to uh, bring to the attention of the International Criminal Court. You said previously that every, everyone has to, pers to pursue the people that are involved in this uh, trafficking and uh, crime against humanity, because we are, this is what they are talking about. Well, the International Criminal Court is one of the major uh, instruments to do this. Uh, we think that involved also the question uh, of the uh, today panel, it's one of the major uh, achieving that we can do. Uh, allow me to end with uh, a reference to the, um, I was very touched when the Director General of UNESCO said that Palmyra was the Venice of the desert. Not only, of course, because being Italian, Venice is for me very important. But also because I think that, I mean, if you know the history of Venice, the history of Venice was built on hundreds of years of tolerance. It was a place where even in the um, worst period of persecution by Christian to other religions in Venice, you had the opportunity to, to live free. Even today, uh, there are a, lo uh, a lot of uh, other communities that thinking about Orthodox Church, Jewish, that have clear hundreds of years experience of living in Venice. This is the other aspect of it to, to fight against the cultural criminality, but also to raise the importance of tolerance in the cultural uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you. I'm about to call upon the Ambassador of Cambodia to give him some, um, some uh, notice about uh, the protection of uh, cultural heritage post-conflict. But as I give him a little bit of warning on that, I might f throw another question at the, ambassador, uh, the Italian Ambassador, which is on this question. Under the current construction of the Rome Statute, um, and uh, therefore the governance arrangements International Criminal Court, um, I'd appreciate your thoughts on, uh, frankly, um, the possibility, likelihood of the jurisdiction being broad enough to do that. Uh, we have to work on it. Uh, uh, no, we, we, of course, we, ha we have to, to work on it. It's, uh, uh, it's not yet clear cases, and until today, we actually, we didn't have cases like this uh, uh, linked with the Statute of Rome. Uh, but this is one of the, our major tasks to do, because the International Criminal Court, it could be the right forum to, 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 to fight all these activities. Well, it's an interesting debate, because um, in the Rome Statute, which um, uh, Foreign Minister Bishop and I well remember, it's passage mm -hmm. through our own national parliament, many debates at the time about the definition of the four grounds by which the ICC could be deployed in international criminal action. This was not one of them. Uh, and therefore, uh, I am um, very open to um, the discussion coming out of this uh, particular gathering here at the Asia Society today as to what should be done in terms of the specific applicability of the jurisdiction. Because if we are serious about the long reach of the law, well, you can go from UN Security Council resolutions, you can go through that to national legislation, and uh, as has been indicated before, proper domestic enforcement regimes on the importation of um, cultural artefacts illegally from abroad. That's one legal mechanism. The, third, the second and parallel one to that is the international criminal jurisdiction if it can be applied. And I would invite comment uh, on that during the course uh, of today. My f uh, colleague and friend, the Ambassador of Cambodia, could you give us uh, your reflections on um, the protection of cultural heritage post-conflict? It's definitely not 
thank you for the opportunity to address this uh, audience. Uh, as you know, our country has been uh, at war, civil war, for over three decades. During that period, uh, a lot of our artifacts have been uh, looted because of insecurity in the remote areas of the countries, the other country. Uh, there are a lot of temples, and for those those temples uh, have been uh, looted. But after we regain our, our peace, our government has been taking some steps to protect our heritage. First, to rebuild what we have lost during the war, civil war. Intentional and intentional, but we're talking now about intentional and by intentional. First of all, uh, we try to preserve and protect what we have left. We try to the the, the main thing is uh, for the remote. We, we stress on the remote area of the country. Those people who live on that, th those sites, we want them to stay there to protect those temples. To do that, we try to give them jobs, train them to respect and to love what they have and what they have been left from our ancestors. We told them that uh, this is our culture, our identity. If we don't have the identity, we don't have history, we don't have anything as a nation. And we try to give them jobs, uh, give them uh, work to do through uh, development of tourism. Second, regarding the uh, artifacts that has been looted and uh, sold in the art market in Asia and Europe and America. We have been working very hard with form of a group of archaeologists, of uh, art lovers, of uh, civil societies, of lawyers, to look into how we get back what has been looted from the country. Uh, the highlight of this, where well, we've been having, uh, we've been receiving those artifacts back one after another. But the highlight of this was in the, between nine, 2000, 13 and 2015, we receive uh, five work of art. For us, there are no values, but uh, in the art market, each one of them are valued at between two to three, two to five million dollars. We receive back six of them between those, that, uh, those three years. The first one, this started with the lawsuit. This is the, the cooperation between the, the United States of America and Cambodia. We have the MOU between the other two countries. And uh, with the assistance of the uh, district uh, uh, attorney office, U.S. Attorney Office of Southern District of New York. We have uh, here present Ms. Sharon Levine, Sheena. Ms. Sharon Levine, she was uh, the lead legal, uh, legal uh, uh, legal expert from USI to sue one company, the Stock Ocean Company, to get back our statue on sale 
on their auction list. After over almost two years, we got them back. And uh, this is to tell you that uh, to do this, we need to uh, have a very, uh, we, are, we have to be very, very prepared. First of all, on the agricultural matter, historical matter, and legal aspect of it. To end, I just want to say that uh, even though our country has lost many of our artifacts, but uh, after uh, our effort, combined effort between UNESCO, friendly countries, and uh, our expert, we can get some of those back. So I guess it's a uh, it's not the end of the world for, 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 for the Middle East. Of course, you know, we, we lost a lot because of the, the, those uh, ter terrorist activities when it comes to cultural uh, heritage. But uh, I hope that uh, when the area come back uh, to peace, uh, they can recover back some of those uh, that are sold in the art market. Thank you so much, Ambassador, reminding us again that this is a global challenge and at present its manifestations in the Middle East. As we conclude this, six points emerge from our conversation this morning. Uh, Irena's uh, strong invocation to us all to reflect the language of cultural cleansing in our international discourse as to what is happening now, not just to the Middle East, but more broadly. Two. Um, to again reinforce the excellent observation of a young man at university in Edinburgh, the destruction of culture because those who destroy culture are intimidated by history. Number three, Julie Bishop's point, domestic legislation, law enforcement to give effect to the existing international conventions which exist of 1954 and 1970. These already have teeth if we give them domestic teeth. Uh, fourthly, non-state actors, conventions as they exist, by and large, are expressed in terms of the actions of states or those acting on behalf of state actors. When we come to the new murky domain of non-state actors, of which Daesh is the most recent and horrendous example, uh, then of course the international legal regime is less clear. And that, I think, is a core challenge which lies before us given the proliferation of non-state actors across the world and the common attributes of a number in terms of the destruction of cultural heritage. Five, the capacity of the ICC to have broader reach. And six, let us not forget where we began this discussion this morning with the extraordinary life, the extraordinary death of Khalid al-Assad, former chief of antiquities of Palmyra. Now, truly, a person to be honoured as a martyr for our common civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance this morning. May I just, sorry, but I think it's appropriate to add just that next Sunday, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jordan and Italy, we will launch at the United Nations headquarters uh, a project dedicated just to the implementation of international legal framework on the protection of cultural heritage. It's a very um, wider participation uh, project. So. Uh, your other Nazis are also very welcome and talk also in the name of our Jordan colleague. Thank you, Thank you very much, yeah. Ambassador. That's um, why I was throwing you the floor before, uh, that you might, <laughs> you might have uh, reminded us all of that. But as they say in the classics, better late than never. So, um, so uh, friends uh, of culture, friends of civilization, friends of the Asia Society, thank you for your attendance this morning. We now have a short video clip before moving to the next session. Please uh, extend your thanks to the ministers who participated. Kevin, thank you. Looking at my phone, I'm tweeting, and for anyone else who wants to tweet and get the word out about this, the hashtag is culture under threat. And um, John Williams, where are you? John.
So John is the managing editor of ABC News, and we have a remarkable video that he oversaw the production of that captures the life cycle of the destruction that we're seeing now. And we'd like to show this as we shift the panels. John, anything you'd like to say as we start? Thank you, Josette. No, just to say that, you know, I think the media also does have a responsibility and an opportunity because we can bring this into people's homes. And, and as we've heard in, in that session before, this is uh, a, a risk and a threat that faces the entire world, not just confined to the region. Um, like Irina, I too was fortunate to go to Palmyra uh, just six months before the start of uh, of the war in, in Syria. And while it was too dangerous for us to go to Palmyra on, on this trip to Syria, you know, I am pleased and, and you know, it's not just something that ABC does, but there are so many news organizations who've committed to continuing to tell the story of what's going on in Syria and in Iraq and to uh, to take into the living rooms of people around the world, just the the impact and the destruction and the threat to the world's heritage that's going on. Thank you, John. And uh, we'll welcome other comments in addition to yours on the role the media can play in getting the word out and really helping. And, and your, your video will show the role the internet's already playing in the trafficking of some of these goods and bring that home. So we get the lights down. We'll show this and... Uh, adjust seats while we do that. We've come to Damascus to see what's being done to rescue Syria's heritage. Because Damascus is the most secure city in the country, all the artifacts that are at risk are brought here to the National Museum. And so we're on our way to meet the team whose job it is to go out, rescue those treasures. The National Museum has been closed to the public, eerily quiet. You see this case and all the other cases emptied out, entire rooms emptied out. But there is one corner of the museum where the work is in overdrive. For these young archaeologists, part of a 2,500 person team, this is their front line against ISIS. How valuable are these pieces in Syrian archaeology? They're priceless. Yes. This is from 3000 BC. Yes. These are some of the 300,000 objects saved from all over the country. This is a hive of activity in here. It's very methodical, but they're moving very fast like a production line. The last step packed delicately into these chests to be taken to top secret locations that we're told are known only to a handful of people in Syria. All of the artifacts that we're seeing here today are from the area of Deir Ezzor in the eastern part of the country. This area has some of Syria's most important archaeological sites and everything here was pulled out as ISIS was advancing. The team fired on by militants last year as they frantically loaded the artifacts onto trucks. For the biggest items that can't be moved, cement boxes are being built around them. The work these archaeologists do often puts their very lives at stake. Just last month, Professor Khalid al-Assad was publicly beheaded by ISIS for refusing to swear allegiance and not revealing hidden artifacts. This garden, it's, it's very important. The man leading this mission is Dr. Mamoun Abdul Karim. It's a strategy to hide all things because we don't know when the crisis will finish. While touring a third century reconstructed synagogue, Abdul Karim tells us his mission is not political, despite working for the Assad regime. Your message is we are it's trying to humanity. protect the world's heritage. Exactly. It's not just Syrian heritage. It's humanity. It's heritage. You cannot all civilization. We have one civilization. Sharing in that duty, even those who oppose the Assad regime. Both sides of the divide, they go out there and risk their lives. So this link is going to be need once this conflict is over. From Ohio, Professor Amr al-Azam helps oversee a team of monuments men, volunteers working on the other side of the front lines, even undercover in held territory. But no matter how hard they work to protect and track these items, the global trade in looted antiquities is booming. Fires as far away as you know, everyone here is probably something expensive things. Professor Mark Al Tawil is an expert so, in what he now calls equities. The scale is, is massive, and it's certainly funding a lot of groups, groups in the conflict. 
that to me is sort of the What kind of prices are we talking about? Uh, large can sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So objects have tremendous. He says most of the illegal trade occurs online. Yeah, and then other objects, you know, they could be from Syria. Though not items can be traced. Altawil wants the sale of all antiquities out of Syria to be stopped. People are not seeing the connections that that antiquity are now funded. And that is a huge uh, game changer for us. This is affecting people's lives. Yeah, Will you be taking this out yeah, as well? Exactly. Back in Damascus, this. Professor Abdul Karim claims that the vast majority of his artifacts are safe for now. But today he receives new groups of more himself antiquities. But we need to be more. We need to have some hope to continue our work. I'm Alex Marquardt in Damascus. Thank you, John. Okay, I think we need to move. Great. There's some open seats here. So um, this section of the program, we not only want to identify, discuss, and prioritize actions, but also to hopefully leave here with a sense of forward movement in, in where we're heading. And I'm going to turn to Deborah Lair and Kate to kind of walk us through a matrix of actions, and then we'll make your where we and if Decide the former champion of. We have uh, some free seats over here too, if others would like to join. First, many thanks to all of you for joining us today. The turnout that we have is truly spectacular across such a broad range of different backgrounds. I think it really demonstrates the interest and the concern about what is happening across the Middle East and what's happening with culture under threat. I know that. Um, you've been very patient in listening, but we thought it was very important to really hear from the governments, to, he to have them have an opportunity to voice their concerns and really understand the challenges that they're facing and what they're looking for in the types of support that can come from a group like all of us. We want to try a little bit of an experiment in making this very interactive. We took a stab at coming up with some innovative types of solutions. Some of these many of you have heard before. Um, some of them may be a little new, some may be controversial, and we obviously welcome any contributions to new solutions and ideas as we try and come up with some kind of plan that could be released or put together some kind of working group that could be ongoing support to UNESCO and the United Nations as they try and struggle with this. Many of you are working in different capacities on these kinds of issues. We have representatives from the Met, from the Smithsonian, from various archaeological groups, the Getty, uh, various archaeological groups who are working on this, people with public relations background, law enforcement, the military, uh, prosecutors, uh, governments, diplomats. So it really is a combined group. Uh, we'll kick off. I think that the solutions are up. We'll display them up here. And just a few ideas. One we heard and the Iraqis have often talked about, and there's been common force, show of force, targeted military strikes or even going as far as boots on the ground, planning for protection, how you work with the governments in advance in developing sort of emergency heritage plans so when there is a crisis and the ability to track hotspots that they have plans in place that they're prepared just like natural emergencies, market-driven options, challenging minds, creative ideas through technology. Uh, and we can go into then with the next slide into some of the specifics. As you can see here, these are some of the ideas. And I'd like to um, 
maybe pick on one person to kick off the conversation. Colonel, would you like to start us off on the law enforcement side? So um, that was one of the themes we heard often from the government. Yes, I, I was thrilled to hear virtually every um, government representative talk about the need for prosecution and, and punishment. Um, and so, so let me say, um, 10 years ago, you know, I, I identified as the number one problem convincing mainstream society, the taxpayers and the voters, that antiquities trafficking actually is funding terrorism. Largely thanks to the people in this room, um, I think that is generally recognized now, culminating, of course, in, in Resolution 2199. So now let's fast forward 10 years. It's 2015. Um, I have, in that time, conducted uh, hundreds of investigations uh, resulting in prosecutions and involving more than 20 countries, uh, seizing, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of, of antiquities. And here's what I will identify today as the number one problem facing the prosecutor, the investigator, the military, the person trying to stop this, the borders. We all represent nations of laws. We respect those laws and we respect the borders. The bad guys do not. A typical case, a typical investigation, let's say it's starting, I'm looking at um, Mr. Secretary from Cambodia, let's say, and I have Cambodian pieces, and I have an active Cambodian investigation. Let's say the piece starts in Cambodia or Tamil Nadu or Afghanistan or Pakistan. That's where some of the evidence will be. That's where some of the witnesses will be. One of the conspirators or more will be in Singapore. Another set of conspirators and another set of evidence will be in London and then New York or moving to the Middle East, pieces that originate in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Libya. That's where some of the evidence will be. That's where some of the witnesses will be. But some of the evidence will be in Amman and Beirut. The hard drives will be in Geneva. The warehouse will be in Geneva. There will be more evidence in London, Paris, and New York. So what do we do if we want to actually prosecute someone? The bad guys move at the speed of bandwidth. Once an investigation is launched in New York, the bad guys have the ability to pick up the phone or get on an, get an email and tell their conspirators in various parts of the world, move the stuff, erase the hard drive, delete the email, move the warehouse. Well, that's what the speed they move at. We in law enforcement cannot just pick up the phone. We are forced to work within an archaic architecture in which in order, a letter is rogatory and following a memorandum of understanding it can sometimes take anywhere from six to nine months to get an answer. If I have an informant who is prepared to give me information to get a search warrant and that informant is in Beirut, I can't just put that person on Skype in front of the judge that I need to search to do the search warrant. I actually have to request the various permissions and by the time that happens for those lawyers in the room, and I know there are a lot, the information is stale. You can't get a search warrant on information that is older than 30 days. And so every time someone says practical measures, my response is scrap. Uh, you said be, you know, you wanted me to start this off. Scrap this archaic system where we have to communicate through letters rogatory. Scrap that we have to go through uh, the Department of State and the Department of Justice and in individual countries. Give us the ability to do what we do in real life. If I have a murderer in New Jersey, I pick up the telephone and I talk to the local police department in that place in New Jersey and I'm there in an hour. That's what we need to have the ability to do. We have good people throughout the world who care about this stuff. 
And we have sufficient laws in many respects. I mean, some countries we can all do better, but we have sufficient laws. I personally, from my perspective, I don't need increased import restrictions. I don't need increased export restrictions. I just need the ability to pick up the phone and talk to someone in Tamil Nadu or in Geneva or in Beirut or in Rome and get the information in a timely fashion so that we can act on it, catch the bad guys, and put them in jail where they belong and return the, the stolen priceless heritage to the country where it belongs. Excellent. Would anyone like to add on the law enforcement side? So one of the issues around uh, import restrictions that has been somewhat effective and sometimes controversial has been the cultural memorandum of understandings led by the State Department. And there had been discussion coming out of the Cairo meeting on having a regional MOU through the Arab League that could move on a quicker basis than having each of the member countries negotiating one of these agreements. Uh, these tend to take a long time for Egypt, who had applied for emergency measures in the midst of their crisis. It's been a negotiation that's been going on for almost two years. But if they can actually be implemented on a more expedited basis. It's something that can be very effective in stopping the borders. Iraq has one, uh, and hopefully with legislation, we'd be able to do the same thing with Syria. Catherine, I don't know if you have any thoughts you'd like to add. You've been doing a lot of work in the region there, and it's important what you're looking at. Sure. Um, I wanted to thank you for bringing that up. The legislation that's proposed is currently pending in the Senate, and it's Senate Bill 1887 and it would restrict the import of Syrian antiquities. And what Deborah mentions is really important because the restriction for countries that the US does not have diplomatic relations with requires legislative action, um, which creates a whole other hurdle in addition um, to trying to get an MOU. Now for Iraq, we've had that legislation in place now since 2008. But as an archeologist, I can tell you that Iraqi material and Syrian material can often be very similar. So it's really important for us, for the Iraqi material as well, to get the Syrian import restrictions in place. Um, so that Senate Bill 1887, it's been introduced by Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. And the other legislation I wanted to mention was H.R. 2285, which has been introduced by Representative Keating. And that speaks much more to the enforcement side of things and dealing with it within U.S. domestic implementation. Uh, if anybody would like to make a comment as well, if you could just tip up your <laughs> yes, please, and we'd be happy to call on you. Okay. Um, first of all, let me just say thank you, Josette and the Asia Society team for really putting together this amazing program. I was very much reminded of the last time when we did something like this, which was called Beyond Bamyan, Will the World Be Ready Next Time? And what's very sad is to recognize that the world wasn't ready the next time. And one of the reasons why it is is that I think we are caught between lawless non-state actors and the lawful countries that are trying to do something. The speed is obviously a huge problem. And I think there is something about in immediate solutions, and intermediate solutions, and a long-term education. It seems to me that one of the areas we learned from Afghanistan is that we also have to think about what happens when the objects are confiscated. And that is that, in fact, we may not be able to send them back to the countries that are right now in the middle of a huge, horrendous war. So we might want to think about, and that's not in one of your solutions, is that is there a way to create a way station an interim museum, which was actually done in Switzerland uh, for Afghanistan. And that is that the objects come together so we don't have the situation that happened in Cambodia. Things got looted, stolen, sold, as they get captured, so that with the law enforcement, we also have to do something about the heritage itself. And <clears throat> I think that would be another way to also just stop this idea of the commercialization of looting that then profits the, those who are doing the destruction. So that may be one of the ideas that we really 
put together, and resources have to be borne uh, by a number of groups, government, non-government, and otherwise, so that there is something about safekeeping of the objects that are confiscated. Because otherwise, everything else takes much too long. And we can't wait for that while the things are getting destroyed. <clears throat> Well, you raise a really excellent point because there's been a lot of discussion about the creation of Asylum for Antiquities, which we left somewhat vague in the description because I know it's it's a, a hot topic and, and certainly even UNESCO is considering legally how they might create that kind of way station, if that's what you want to call it, and under the circumstances. On that, I know Richard would like to talk, and Richard, I'm not sure if that's related to the asylum issue. Uh, if not, maybe if we can keep on that topic for just one minute, if people are going to address that issue before we move to the next one. Yes. Please. On that topic, um, Vishaka has given us a perfect opening. I'm with the Association of Art Museum Directors. Vishaka is one of our former presidents of our board. And I'm happy to say that uh, the association is working on protocols for safe havens. We have a vetting process, and we're almost through that vetting process. And so we're very excited that we can share this eventually with the US community of museums and eventually the international community. Um, it's been uh, looked at and commented on by a number of people in the art museum community and um, others. And so we're hoping that shortly that will be available. <coughs> and I think it will be a useful um, tool for the international community. Absolutely. We really appreciate that. Uh, Richard? Thank you, Deborah. Um, in fact, Dr. Coburn, who I just met for the first time a few minutes ago, was asking me what I'm doing here. <laughs> and I think he was right because... That's what I do. No, of course. <laughs> uh, because I'm not, as he said, one of his usual suspects. <laughs> but thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you, Debra, for inviting me because I'm discovering the amplitude of the issue. I was born in a city in Morocco, Fes, which is a part of the UNESCO heritage. And one of my uh, work also was to organize for years the Nobel Laureate Conference, the Nobel Laureate Conference in Petra, in Jordan. And I was asking myself, oh my God, what should I do if these two amazing cities are in danger? First of all, I think, Deborah, we should bring here in the conversation much more CEOs, much more people from the private sector. The coalition should definitely be supported by the private sector. Um, two, I think we should launch very quickly a big worldwide campaign, a media campaign and would be happy to commit and to help you. Uh, WPP, the Global Communication Group, is part of my shareholders, and I'm sure we will be happy to support. Because at the end of the day, I see many doctors here around the table. I see many great experts. But I think we should target now urgently the youth. The youth through social media campaign. And as we saw in the a very great movie from ABC, you see these young Syrians who are super committed to try to protect part of the heritage. So definitely, I think we should, uh, we should talk to the youth. The coalition should definitely get some financial support from the private sector to do this campaign. And um, of course, we cannot compare what is not comparable. But when we see what we did with the anti-poaching campaign, and I'm quite involved in Africa, and I saw the past two, three years what we were able to, uh, to do to fight against this uh, anti-poaching campaign and to support financially all these actions. I think we should take some best practices of what we did even with, uh, when I started CGI, the Clinton Global Initiative years ago with President Clinton, we, we, we built this DNA of the CGI through commitment. And I think it's important to, to get some commitments from, uh, again, the private sector and from governments. Because at the end of the day, uh, forgive me to be very basic, you have great ideas here on the chart, but you will need money. And you will need support from the people who can really be game changers. And um, 
this is a little contribution, not at all being an expert like you, doctor. No. But I think we should uh, definitely launch very quickly through the coalition this awareness campaign, because uh, I'm not sure the world is really able to measure the uh, amplitude of the issue today. If I could just say, uh, this is a wonderful offer, and Richard Adias, I know well from my time as Vice Chair of the World Economic Forum. He's part of the magic behind a lot of the things that move the world on those forums as uh, Executive Chairman of Publicis Events Worldwide. So thank you, a very significant contribution. If I could, uh, if we could just go to James for a moment from the Getty, James Kuhn, are you here? You had a great op-ed in the Wall Street Journal this week. Um, and I'd love for you to just surface a few of the ideas that I think you had on there, just to get them up here for comment also, including work on the borders, policing the borders, and boots on the ground in the UN. Thank you very much. And thanks for the, the invitation uh, to, to hear all the good um, ideas that have been presented and discussed. Um, well, they, the, the ideas that I had are the ones that you um, uh, identified and, and some others, but I have to say that I'm concerned a little bit about um, the, what I hear in the meeting this morning because I, I do feel like we are um, um, missing s the big issue uh, and, and that we're looking at relative, something that could be relative, described as relatively low-hanging fruit. And those are the uh, portable objects that move across borders. Because we have a regime in place, however successful or not successful it is, there is one in place to prevent that movement of illegally uh, excavated <coughs> objects acro across borders. Uh, first at the border itself, the border then of Iraq and Syria, um, and neighboring borders, but then beyond that as well. So we have something in place to deal with that, however effective or ineffective it might be. But the larger one is the one that was raised, I think, by the ambassador to Italy, and he's, his government is identified with calling for blue helmet actions, because the Temple of Bell wouldn't have been stopped by policing the borders to protect, uh, to, to inhibit or to restrict the movement of, of portable objects. It would only be stopped by people protecting the site. And it's going to take boots on the ground to do so. And anything less than that, I think, is going to be um, less than effective. Uh, and I think that while we concentrate on the portable objects, that we are also doing something that is perhaps um, injuring or, or weakening our ability to respond. And, and that is that we are not, at least to my knowledge, um, um, identifying firmly and convincingly the extent to which the trade is funding uh, the terrorist activities of ISIS. It's, been, it's said and it's repeated, but it, there, there's little, as far as I, I'm aware of, uh, concrete evidence to that effect. So we, we're putting, as it were, all of our um, efforts in, on, on, in an area that might be described as low-hanging foods and might also be less than we, we say it is and therefore might be weakening our position and our argument for it. Um, and, and so I would like to see two things. One is I'd like to see something clearer, uh, something more convincing, something more precise, something that has, has some, some strength behind it with regard to the consequence of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, portable object uh, problems. And then I'd, I'd like to see us move, um, in addition to restricting the, the, the illegal trade and such objects, to something that really is going to be protecting and preventing the destruction of cultural property in the region. Uh, that's boots on the ground on the one hand, but then it's also uh, obviously the biggest problem is just restoring um, uh, a functional and credible um, uh, government in, this, in, in the area, um, policing in the area, military in the area, all the things that are going to be long-term solutions to a very difficult and problematic situation. Those are all really excellent suggestions. And I think one of the biggest challenges is one that you put your finger on, which is coming up with realistic numbers. And that has been a big challenge in the community. We've been asking UNODC to try and use the formulas that they've used through drugs, and some of the other um, international global crimes to see if they could come up with some realistic numbers on the trade because we all bandy around a six billion dollar figure that I think is about 15 years old and that certain people claim they made up. So trying to come up with something that's much more realistic would help on the credibility, as you said, in identifying where the real resources need to be placed. I think the number of tents went up on this side. Emily, I think you. 
I just I'd wanted like to, to mention, um, and it shows, it sort of highlights the degree to which we're all doing things, and some, and our communications probably isn't as good as it could be. But anyway, to um, the gentleman's points over here, the Met will host on Tuesday, the 29th at 4:30, um, a, a conversation. It's sponsored by the State Department and the Met. Conflict Antiquities: Forging a Public and Private Response to Save the Endangered Patrimony, addressing uh, this this. Uh, private support issue, engaging um, uh, the role of private institutions and collectors who are very important in these areas in this, and also can be supportive uh, as part of the, of the private sector, as a matter of fact, significant part of the private sector. So anybody who would like to attend that can um, be in touch with us at the Met. You're, you're welcome to come. Uh, gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we have a golden opportunity. I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself? Oh, we, can't, sure. we can't actually see the tents way sorry, down here. Sorry, so. sorry. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Larry Coben, the head of the Sustainable Preservation Initiative and the usual suspect commentator. Um, I think we have a golden opportunity here to do work not just for culture in conflict areas, but for everything. And I would hate for us to lose sight of that. I have a very difficult time distinguishing between someone blowing up a temple in a threat of war and a real estate developer driving his bulldozer through a pyramid of, and destroying a, a, an ancient structure or an ancient site. If we're concerned about heritage, then we should be concerned about all of those and use this as a rallying point, especially because I think we have a better chance to accomplish things in non-conflict zones. It's not to say we should ignore them, but if we focus all of these resources and all of our implementation on these 23 things in conflict zones, I think we're going to lose an awful lot of heritage in the rest of the world because every day we lose more heritage to economic development and looting outside of conflict zones and is disappearing every day in the Middle East. And I don't want us to lose sight of that. And a lot of these regimes that we're talking about, I think you can probably get more countries to jump on board if it's relevant to the heritage in their own places. And I just don't want us to lose sight of that. The second thing is we talked, uh, I think it was Secretary uh, Bukova in the beginning talked about the millennial goals. Many of these don't fit into the millennial goals, which were about alleviating folks from poverty. Heritage has an important role to play, and the Millennium Goals are the most powerful tool you have for incorporating a broad, broad network of nations. You know, we work every day on economic relationship between economic development and heritage and implementing that, and I think we should take advantage of the incredibly talented people. I think it will interest the CEOs a lot more as well, because uh, so I used to be one. Uh, if we can, in fact, make this a very broad-based campaign pivoting off of culture in conflict to cultural heritage more broadly. And Larry, I think you've been very successful in creating jobs around heritage, right? And, and that really is one of the solutions as well as creating economic opportunities. So you didn't. I didn't want to do a commercial for ourselves, so yes. <laughs> but yes, thank you. Yes. Um, First, I, I do want to say to James, I, I never expected we'd see the day where arts institutions are calling for boots on the ground. And I, I can see the colonel's anxious to jump in, maybe on some of the practical realities uh, that he's mentioned on that, because what we heard this morning is even when there are boots on the ground, maybe they can't be effective in this, so the tools that could do that. So we'd love to tease that out a little more. But I, I just want to take this opportunity to put someone on the spot. Mr. Tan Boon Hui, who uh, is of the National Heritage Board of Singapore, the former director of the National Museum of Singapore, and the newly announced Vice President of Asia Society's Arts and Cultural Global um, Operations. So, um, Boon Hui, I'm putting you on the spot, and uh, now you're going to have to say something. <laughs> And welcome to New York. This is uh, his second day in New York, and he hasn't officially started as he finishes his duties with Singapore's 50th anniversary as one of the top arts and culture officials there. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Josette. Um, I'm basically a, a museum person and a, a curator, so rather than a policy uh, professional. But uh, looking at uh, this is, this is a very, very difficult issue, primarily, I think, because we are actually talking about two 
things which are related, but they actually require perhaps slightly different responses. One is the actual destruction of an in situ site, which is rather different from uh, movable objects that circulate into the the uh, global sort of art economy, and that's where you know, as as curators and the the collecting sort of economy uh, gets into it. Um, to J I do sort of agree with uh, Jay's point that especially when we are talking about the preservation of uh, an in situ site, I do not really see an option other than literally preventing that destruction uh, in a very physical sense. I mean, we may digitize part of it, but literally you, you do lose the site. Uh, so unless we are able to prevent that destruction, uh, I, I think that that is slightly more difficult to deal with. Uh, with regard to the movement of um, material, one thing that a lot of people have been talking about is is it is there a possibility of identifying or a system of identifying in areas of conflict which are exactly the movable material or the potential movable material? Um, if we expect that, if you follow the trade that these go to, for example, private collectors, then one of the things that that could discourage that is to literally put into the public domain images of these are the movable material. So, you know, you can't buy anything in secret. You can't, you know, show it, lend it to a museum or gallery because someone will point out, hey, this thing is on that, that kind of list. Uh, the second thing is, I think, other than the borders, the other sort of, we should look at the nodal points at which movable material uh, passes through. And obviously, aside from borders, the other part is warehousing whether uh, it's very difficult, but there, there, there is a lot of housing that uh, material goes in transit where materials sort of disappear. It's, we all know it's, it, it's, it's one of the black holes, but um, you know, if there is certain kinds of action looking at the warehousing of specific materials and how uh, information, perhaps, you know, law enforcement at some level, if needed, they are able to get specific information uh, about the material that is going through warehouses. I think that sort of complements the enforcement action at the borders. I think we should look at all the the transit points. It's By the time it reaches the, the actual market itself, I think it's a little too late. Uh, by then. That's my two points. Thank you. Thank you. Those are excellent points, and I'm sure um, the Colonel has some points having talked about these issues of warehouses and borders and where the checkpoints are and the legalities of addressing some of those issues. But Matt, did you want to comment? And Catherine, I think you had another comment to make too. <clears throat> um, thank you, and thank you for again the opportunity. Um, Debbie made a great point about about dollar amounts. Um, I am always skeptical about when we try and put a dollar amount on an illegal trade because truly you don't know what you don't know. Um, but we should be very clear on, on one thing. There is no doubt that antiquities trafficking is funding terrorism and has since at least 2005. No one should walk away from this meeting thinking that that's an open question. Um, in terms of what percentage, you should not confuse what is publicly released with what exists. Like it or not, because of the connection with terrorist activities, the vast majority of this information is classified. Every time I speak about it, I really have to clear it and make sure that I'm not releasing classified information. Going back to 2005, when Al-Qaeda was funding its activities through the use of uh, antiquities trafficking, it was second only to kidnappings and ransom. That's real figures on a daily basis based on my activities for two years tracing this. It was their number two source of funding. Uh, dollar amounts, uh, a lot. Um, when you recognize that each dollar means a bullet and a bomb that's going to kill somebody else, uh, you know, one dollar is too much. 
move now to ISIS. ISIS, um, the speakers before were so spot on accurate. ISIS has institutionalized uh, what Al Qaeda had done in the Middle East. They have not created any new structures. It's the same smuggling architecture that has been in place, but they have institutionalized it. Um, they have, by the most recent uh, tally, 4,500 archaeological sites in their area, and they are making tens of millions. And that, I'm telling you, is a low figure. That is not exaggerated when the G7 came up with that number. Um, these are real numbers. So please, don't walk away thinking this is not a primary source, not the number one source, but among the primary sources of income for ISIS. For every piece they destroy on camera, they sell hundreds of others and line their coffers and finance their campaign of death. With regard to boots on the ground, I support boots on the ground, knowing full well that it's probably going to be my boots, but it has to be part of an overall strategy. It is not a cure-all. It has to first, with regard to each individual country, the boots that are on the ground has to establish, for example, rules of engagement. When can you shoot when can you not shoot? When can you defend yourself? When can you use deadly physical force to protect a piece of alabaster or a limestone? This is coming from someone who's actually done this. So I'm telling you, you have to be prepared to issue clear directives and clear guidelines. If the people who are doing the looting are armed, and they have automatic weapons, and there's 12 of them, are you allowed to shoot in order to prevent them from destroying that site? You have to answer that question head on. You can't, you can't fudge that. You have to say it. Whatever it is, say it, and those become your rules of engagement. The second part of the comprehensive strategy is that you have to include the host nation in the process. A proposal I made seven or eight years ago, it takes ordinarily to, to train a professional security for six months. FBI Academy, NYPD, Police Academy, Marine Corps, Officer Candidate School, they're all six months. That's how long it takes to train professionals. I do propose and, and have continue to propose sending a legitimate force to protect a site, say, 500 for, I'll pick Babylon, because I know how many it takes to, to protect Babylon. You say you're going to provide 500 uh, boots on the ground to protect Babylon. I, I don't know Palmyra. I don't know how many it takes. I haven't done a, a, a recon, so I couldn't tell you that. Um, those 500 arrive in country, and they are met with 500 untrained Iraqi recruits. For the next six months, they live and train together and at the end of six months, you have a professional trained Iraqi force and those boots on the ground from wherever, whether they're blue helmets or not, those can go home or they can move on to another site. In short order, you can, in fact, have trained professional host nation forces protecting the site. And then my last point, but it has to be done with sanity. We were training forces in El Ambar, in the west of, of Iraq, and it was a wonderful moment for me when I turned over a series of a group of trained um, Iraqi recruits to start protecting some of the sites outside a particular village. I returned to the site, th to the area 30 days later, not a single guard was on the site. They were all in the village. They were, they were still there. They hadn't deserted. They hadn't left. They were still there. But they were protecting the, the village, the city center itself. I went to one of the individuals in a position of authority to whom I had ceremonially turned over these, these uh, uh, guards uh, a month earlier. And I said, what are you, what are you doing? I, I gave you trained security guards uh, to protect the sites outside the village. And they're in the village. And he replied to me, yes, thank you very much. Um, as soon as I can stop them from killing my people, 
I will put them on the on the sites outside my village. We can ignore that. We can close our eyes and say, okay, we've given you trained security guards for sites. Well, they're the host nation. They're the sovereign nation. They get to choose where to put their resources. And if given a choice between people and rocks, um, they're going to choose people. Great. Thanks. Catherine, did you want to add him? And we only have, we're going to try and move a little bit towards, now we're identifying some of the loose solutions, sort of next steps, and we just want to make sure we've got a little bit of time for that. Thanks. I just wanted to build on the issue that while we don't have exact figures or numbers, we can certainly see the extent of looting in the satellite imagery of the archaeological sites. Um, and those are now moonscapes pitted out in the desert. Um, and the other thing I wanted to speak to is that although we don't have exact numbers, we have some pretty good evidence from the Abu Sayyif raid, which was publicly uh, made public this summer. Um, and those images really detail, State Department's released these images on their website, they really detail the coins, the ivories, and a variety of artifacts that have shown up in this raid. They had Iraq museum numbers on them. They came from the Mosul Museum. And that's crucially important for us to think about when we talk about whether or not this looting is really happening. Um, I just also wanted to build on the boots on the ground idea. Um, and I wanted to encourage us as we start thinking about our next steps to talk about ground-based projects. Um, that it isn't just um, armed actors, but it's also facilitating folks who are already acting on the ground and working in tandem with very brave colleagues who are already there. Um, in the ABC film clip, we saw uh, the guys at the Mara Museum. Um, they've been helped by Cory Wegner here at the Smithsonian and uh, the Shoshi Project, of which I'm a part. And they really worked with very extraordinarily brave Syrian colleagues at the Mara Museum to tie back and protect these mosaics. And that was successful. You know, when they had a bomb out last recently, those mosaics survived. Um, I just got back from Iraq about three weeks ago. Um, and I was there on an emergency training effort. And I can tell you that our colleagues on the ground are really committed to protecting their sites, and they simply need help to do so. Where is Corinne? I'm Corinne Wagner. Oh, there you are. Just thank you for the effort you've been making at the Smithsonian. Yes. Uh, the Kaplan Foundation made that possible for us. I mean, there's really, and Catherine, you raise, I think, a really important point. There is a lot of amazing work that's going on in many different places, and how we create some kind of coordination effort so that it's all complementary and that people are aware. And if we do get more of the corporate sector involved in this and creating funding, what those funding models are to ensure that good projects like that are getting funding. Obviously, the foundations are doing an amazing amount of work, but these are things I think that a lot of corporations would be interested in supporting if we can make sure that, that somehow there's a coordination point, whether it's through the Smithsonian or an organization that would be tracking all of that. One idea that had been surfaced was creating kind of the equivalent of Doctors Without Borders and Archaeologists Without Borders that could be some kind of umbrella organization to go into conflict areas and work with individuals who are on the ground to support that kind of idea. Um, I think we have a tent up here. And then Tess, if you want to. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Mark Mazarovsky, and I'm with the Holocaust Art Restitution Project. So you, I am the proverbial outsider, but I've been working with uh, the idea of with looted objects from the Second World War. But as my experience has shown, uh, the methods of looting and recycling are pretty much the same, whether it's 1935 or last week. So. Uh, you might not like some of the things I'm going to tell you, but I think it's more the man on the street ideas. I've always seen the market as really the uh, the major uh, problem in the uh, in the way that looted objects get vehicled, uh, mostly clandestinely, but sometimes really in broad daylight. So I would like to propose very briefly that. Um, the documentation for these kinds of objects should be extremely tightened and far more uh, examined, almost to the point where they should be regulated. And I know that the German government came up with some idea like this, but they didn't seem to follow through, at least uh, for now. Um, I had spoken with uh, people in uh, certain African countries, and 
they like the idea of uh, moratoriums on the market. In other words, just blanket prohibitions of trading in any kind of objects coming from certain areas until dealers and collectors get the idea that you have to be very careful with these objects because it seems like anything that falls short of this does not uh, seems to fall on deaf ears. I know that some institutions are better than others, some dealers are better than others, but fundamentally we have a very serious problem which is making money off looted objects wherever they come from and however which way. I agree that military invention, intervention is critical. Uh, people used to die uh, to protect cultural heritage. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case these days. We're a little bit more lax. I'm not asking all of you to, uh, to go and, and get killed, but it's, the idea is to put our uh, minds and our money where our mouths are, and if we are so serious about protecting these sites, then we have to do it physically. Um, there's no other way of doing it. And finally, this is sort of one of the more brazen ideas, I think, but um, is to create an international tribunal specifically dealing with acts of plunder. Uh, it's going a little further than what's been proposed, but I think it just rejoins the, uh, the International military, military Tribunal in Nuremberg in 1946, where plunder was, in fact, deemed to be a crime against humanity. So not only are we talking about cultural cleansing, but we're also talking about cultural genocide. Thank you. Mark, those were really, really insightful. Thank you for, for that. Uh, Tess, and then I think, Kate, if you want to go after that, Tess. Um, thank you, Mark. We're very close to the community. Can you Hi. Um, good afternoon. This, my name is Tess Davis, and I'm executive director of the Antiquities Coalition, um, as well as a lawyer um, with a background in archaeology. And um, I was very pleased to hear Mark's comments right now, especially that of a, a reconciliation or, or even a pure tribunal. But I'd like to just respond briefly um, to what Dr. Cuno said earlier. I was uh, read very eagerly, sir, your, your op-ed this week, and I was pleased to see such a leader in the art and museum community come out in support of legislative action in the form of 1493, um, which I know many of the people at this table today have followed very closely. And I, I would say I'd like to share your frustration with the lack of numbers as someone who's worked in this field for over 10 years now, trying to find these numbers. It's incredibly difficult. And I think all of us at the table want these numbers. My, my background is in Cambodia, and we have done extensive research on the trade during their conflict there that took place in the 1970s. And I would just like to stress, as we think about these solutions and the urgency of them, that it's only become possible now, 40 years after the war, to know what happened, to have any semblance of what happened, who did it, why, how. We don't have 40 years to wait before we, before we take action. We can't wait for the good numbers, even though I completely agree we need them very desperately. Yes, I'm Kate Seeley, Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute, and it's been a great honor to uh, be engaged in this forum today. And I wanted to pick up on a few ideas that uh, Deborah mentioned and uh, the foreign Min ministers mentioned earlier, and that's about the issue of really building a framework to coordinate all the activities across these multi-disciplines working in this field of heritage, fighting heritage, destruction. We have academia involved, NGOs, government agencies, and the fear is that there can be redundancy. The fear is that there can be overlap, and we need to figure out what this umbrella group can be uh, to create the framework to better coordinate all these act, uh, activities so we can maximize impact and minimize a redundancy. And maybe, Deborah, we can talk a little bit later about who that can be. Is it, is it UNESCO, which is already doing excellent work uh, in this area, but tasked with even more work? Is it uh, a government, um, you know, a demand side government agency that can be tasked with this? Is it uh, Archaeologists Without Borders? who can facilitate this framework that is so uh, important. Uh, we also need to engage uh, the region more, and that's why it was so important to have the foreign ministers here today. It was a real show of their commitment uh, to engaging in this issue. And I think that the, the Cairo conference that was held in May is a very good model going forward because there, Arab governments uh, did commit uh, to, to principles to, to move ahead on this matter, including establishing a task force to fight 
cultural racketeering. And that's the kind of uh, institution that we can partner with. We hope that this task force will become operational. And uh, we at the Middle East Institute will do what we can to help it become operational because that's who we here you know, in the West need to be, to be working uh, with uh, to engage further on this issue. And we see Cairo, Egypt, which has already done so much in this area, which is a natural convener, as a leader in the region on this uh, fight against uh, cultural heritage uh, racketeering. And just one uh, final uh, note about this issue. You know, this is an enormous uh, tragedy. But of course, in all tragedies, uh, there is an opportunity. And I think uh, this issue... Uh, allows East and West to, to come together, to work together, uh, to fight the destruction of our, of our shared uh, humanity. So this really is, there's an opportunity to do what the Asia Society is committed to and what MEI is committed to, to do, and that is to build bridges through this tragedy. Um, and one last note that was mentioned, I believe, by uh, Mr. Rudd, which is about um, uh, the issue of, of linking this issue to people's lives. Uh, people's lives are at stake here. That is the priority. And we need to do a better job of explaining to the people in the region uh, how it is that protecting and preserving uh, monuments and shrines and stones uh, is about actually um, uh, working toward their well-being and, and, and the sustainability of their communities. That, that, that is needed to be repeated over and over to continue to build uh, trust. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rick Ali. I'm a, an archaeologist at Boston University. And at the risk of beating a dead horse, I wanted to continue uh, talking a little bit about the uh, points that were raised by Mark and Professor, uh, Colonel Bogdanos and some others. You're a professor to me, Colonel, um, <laughs> with all the work you've done. But I, I think it's important to, to, when we think about the, the looting issue, which is separate from you know, bombing sites and blowing things up like that, uh, to remember, as, as you pointed out, that this is also about the archaeological context and information, which is so precious for uh, helping us to learn about these cultures and sites. So in addition to worrying about restitution of looted material, we should think about trying to prevent further looting. And we know that ISIL didn't invent looting. Looting has been going on for a long time in this region, and it's certainly intensified. Um, we know that too. But looting is a function of a system that runs on supply and demand in large part. So maybe uh, while we're all despairing to a certain extent what's going on and our inability to go over there and fix it right away, um, maybe we can work at the um, at this end, which is the sort of the demand setting end or the user end of a system that starts with ISIL and looting and, and could end up in a, an auction house or a museum or a private collection. So I was thrilled to hear your uh, suggestion for a moratorium. It's easier for archaeologists and those who aren't in the, you know, in the art world to perhaps suggest a moratorium. But uh, would it not be possible for uh, museums museum associations, dealer associations, the auction houses, and, and talking to the private collectors to, to think about something like that and say, look, this is a horrific crisis that's affecting cultural heritage throughout the world. Let's just stop buying things and acquiring things for now. I'm sympathetic to the idea of an asylum, and I'm not sympathetic to the idea of buying things on the market for that asylum, because I think it would just continue the, the cycle of looting. But would not a moratorium perhaps diminish the uh, demand? And if not, you could say, well, Germany would, wouldn't do it. Maybe we'd have the, at least the moral satisfaction of knowing that we were trying to do the right thing here and sending a powerful message, not just to ISIL, but to everybody in the world, that this matters and this is something we could learn from. So I, I, I liked your thought of a moratorium and, and just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Larry, did you have something related to this topic? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm Larry Rothfield uh, from the University of Chicago Pass for Sale Project. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on the idea of a moratorium um, by, by um, uh, su suggesting that, although that I think it's a wonderful idea, I think the reality is that, that, that we've got a global market so that it's going to be very difficult, I think, to, to actually enforce a global moratorium unless we have uh, other... Um, uh, techniques in place to uh, make make you know police the market, but also to allow the market to 
uh, to police itself. So I just want to make uh, uh, three suggestions of ways in which we could, understanding that this is a black market and trying to trying to police it and where we can, but also to try to reduce uh, reduce the market in various ways. So market reduction strategies that um, we talk about in relationship to other markets involve things. Number one, transparency requirements for. We could we could we could require all sales of antiquities to involve over a certain threshold to involve registering that antiquity, putting a photograph of it in in a registry. Um, we could also impose a, a something like a pollution tax on sales of antiquities, uh, understanding that even uh, legal sales uh, that are of, of antiquities that are perfectly um, uh, safe are, are uh, sending a signal to the black market and that signal is um, uh, spurring more looting. And so the model of a pollution tax where you're trying to produce something that's good for the public but produces bad externalities is something that um, is, is uh, well understood in policy fields in other areas. And that, that money could go directly to the kinds of um, uh, support for local efforts uh, to monitoring of sites and other work that, that we're talking about having an umbrella organization perform. Um, the last idea that we're that we're working with at the university is, uh, and other people have been proposing as well, is um, to try to shift the market away from uh, from uh, a market in in which collectors buy antiquities. To try to reduce the market demand for buying of antiquities by um, developing an, a leasing market, so that antiquities collectors would, instead of going uh, going onto the black market and buying dodgy antiquities, would have a chance to uh, take one of James Cuno's uh, antiquities from his storeroom, perhaps, and um, in, in exchange uh, donate uh, uh, you know, to, a, to the same kinds of efforts that are going on here. Well, that, that's definitely one of the more innovative ideas <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the leasing, certainly. Um, one, just getting back to some of the practical ideas that had come up, one was the importance of sort of knowing what you have. And Bonnie, I wondered if I could sort of pick on you to talk a little bit about the World Monument Fund and the fact that you focus so much on inventories and how many of the countries that we're talking about don't have the inventories about what they've actually excavated or even digitized inventories from the museums. Thank you, Deborah, for that invitation. Um, I I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that have been said earlier by others, um, Larry Coben in particular, about the fact that this is a universal problem. It's not only an issue that's associated with places that are under uh, particular threat right now. Um, the And uh, what Matthew said before about the antiquated nature of the criminal justice system, the uh, the nature of the heritage management system around the world is also very antiquated. Uh, in uh, perhaps not so much in Western museums, but uh, if there were some way that Western museums could share their capabilities in terms of heritage management and inventories, in particular, with museums in other parts of the world, uh, that would be a collaborative activity in the long term that would make a lot of difference. Uh, we are involved with the Getty Conservation Institute in developing um, a site inventory system, uh, which is called Arches, which has been made available at no cost um, and is maintainable at no cost because it's open source for um, specifically for countries to be able to manage um, their inventories of heritage sites. There hasn't been a huge amount of pickup on this. Uh, in part because of the uh, lack of commitment to the staffing costs of managing heritage uh, management systems. Uh, and so I would probably put that on a wish list in terms of planning for protection uh, to uh, invest more resources uh, and, and to try to raise more visibility uh, within uh, the, through, the, through this network that you've established involving um, the foreign affairs departments of the countries uh, of the necessity of investing more resources in, uh, in heritage management. Uh, and I just wanted to make a little, go back to what was being said about um, moratorium uh, and just make a reference to the fact that um, this is a very similar situation to the situation involving um, illicit traffic in elephant tusks and the destruction of the elephant herds in, um, in Africa. 
And that uh, issue has gained a great deal of international political capital, largely being led by people like Hillary Clinton and others who've been uh, drafted into service um, in order to persuade other countries to join this ban. And it's, it's, it, uh, the leadership is from the very top level of government. And now um, focusing efforts on education in Asia, in the Asian countries where ivory is still very much um, a market uh, commodity and trying to persuade um, China, for example, to stop um, allowing the purchase of manufacture of ivory objects. So I think there's a lot to be learned from that. Uh, as a model for how you could have an effective kind of system to convince people not to buy antiquities from areas that are so much at risk. And one more point, um, the mitigation of this damage is going to become a big issue at some stage. The impact uh, that looting's had on so many uh, very important archaeological sites all over the region. And so I think a strategy for how you deal with the aftermath of a heavily looted site, something like Apamea, uh, in terms of its um, stabilization, conservation, and future protection, is something that the field could work on and contribute to uh, some eventual opportunity uh, to address the needs of sites in the aftermath of this catastrophe. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. I think that post-conflict um, uh, challenge is going to create a good opportunity for coordination as well. I think we're getting close to the end of time, so we're going to say four people. If I could ask you just to keep comments relatively short. Tom, you had had your Curtis. flag up. Would love to have your thoughts. Yes, you. Andy, and then back uh, to Emily, maybe to finish us off with the four. Oh, and uh, Chuck, kind of 30 seconds to go around or more. Tom Nagorski, Tom. Executive Vice President, 30 seconds. It's just a follow to the boots of on the Asia ground. Society. <laughs> yes, of Asia Society. So sorry. Well, thank you. Um, it, it really came up when James and Colonel McDonough were talking, but boots on the ground spins my mind into planes in the air. And when I hear all the talk about war crimes, I just take it to another level, which is maybe also very provocative, which is if we see, and we know we can see, uh, ISIS or whoever they are headed for Palmyra or someplace else where there's an open view uh, and we think it's a war crime, that's a very, very heavy couple of words, then is it okay to strike? And if not, why not? It really probably is a question that should have been posed to the foreign ministers as well. You see Tom's background as a uh, head of ABC News International for many years and on the front lines of these war zones. Um, Abby Stanglin, K2 Intelligence. Um, along the lines of um, comments about cataloging, cataloging and documenting, um, I just wanted to mention that our firm has recently partnered with a group that's developing um, a non-invasive, unique plant-based DNA marker. Um, and previously they've used it for food sa safety um, reasons, and also it's now um, mandated for certain DOD purchasing. So we've, you know, different applications at this point, um, but we've just been considering whether there may be um, some use in terms of marking antiquities and, and blocking um, illicit purchases. And Abby should mention where she got her start. <laughs> the Manhattan DA's office. <laughs> <coughs> Chuck, do you want to go? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Chuck Henry, President of the uh, Council on Library and Information Resources in Washington, D.C. Three points, Deborah. One, I think we cannot overemphasize the importance of the use of technology for this crisis. Um, for some of the reasons that Bonnie was talking about, the, the, the construction of a digital repository or what I would call a digital library. One, to reveal the uh, incredible history there, the artifacts and the objects that we, that we don't know we have and the ones that we do know that we have, uh, to use this digital library for tracking, as the, the, the chart shows, um, crowdsourcing. There is wonderful software now where uh, 10 people can take pictures of different parts of, a, of an object, and the software will reconstruct a three-dimensional image of it. So there's, there's tremendous technology out there to recreate what's on the ground now, to track it, to inventory it. 
um, as well as to engage, I think, a wider population with this region and with its, its history. Second point, because of the importance of technology in response to this crisis, I would love to see and even participate in um, a, a multinational collaborative effort to create a digital library for the Middle East. Mm. Um, just build it. We can do it. The technology's there. It's not that expensive. It's a matter of will and a matter of focus. Last point, if you build a library like this, if you build a repository of this scale, it is itself a recreation of history. It becomes a historical narrative unto itself. And because it's virtual, it's a history that is well beyond the reach and the touch of a terrorist weapon. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Andy, did you want to comment? Andy Vaughn, I'm the executive director of the American Schools of Oriental uh, Research. <clears throat> Over the last year, uh, ASOR has been involved um, documenting da damage in Syria and Iraq, and it's been a very um, uh, depressing thing to do. Um, it's, I've also been encouraged at how traditional academic boundaries and competition boundaries have um, disappeared over the last year. And I think this is something that we need to continue to, to build on. I've been really encouraged how other organizations have contributed um, pro bono time and have helped us in our work, and I hope that we have done the same thing. Um, two conferences that I've been a part of have used an analogy that I heard uh, about three or four months ago. One was in um, Berlin with European colleagues a couple we weeks ago at the Smithsonian, and the analogy of uh, swim lanes was used. I, I really think that there are a lot of projects who are doing very similar work. And that's not bad, but there is a lot of duplication of effort as well. Going back to my comment, I'm so pleased that people are willing to work together, but we need to find a way to share what we're doing and find our swim lane where we're doing good work and not want to expand uh, somewhere else. As an example, um, ASOR has made a very conscious decision not to get into capacity building because there are other groups that are already doing great work. We were taught, heard what Corey was doing and uh, and uh, Soshi. So, so, so that's not an area where we should go. Um, I'm very pleased that with our European colleagues, we're very close to signing an MOU where we're going to literally hand over our whole data sets and determine uh, workflow for the next year of what each group can do. I'm not sure there can be, going back to Deborah, your comment, I'm not sure because of all the different groups there can be an oversight body, but I think there can be a coalition of groups where we, I think the world is willing to help like no other time before because we're all horrified by what we see. And now's the time that we must 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 step forward. So I'm, I'm really encouraged. Um, and just to clarify, I was not talking about an oversight body by any means. Uh, last two comments, it is basically time, but we'll give the floor to the museum community for the last two comments. <laughs> Please. Um, just, just briefly, we're obviously in the in the midst of the of the heart of this this struggle, this horrific struggle. I'd say that uh, museums, um, as part of their mission and the core of their mission, about the readiness to Vishaka's earlier point of being ready this time for when the conflict does subside, because it will at some point. So I think the Met is dedicated to being ready with all of the. Um, the, the background and the aids that we can. There will be a, a conference in Istanbul that is sponsored by the Met, Colombia, and Rami Koch coming up in October with colleagues from Iraq still having difficulty um, assuring that the colleagues from Iraq will be able to come. But the point is for this readiness to, in the midst of all that was said today and that all is being done, to um, absolutely 
deal with the here and the now and the boots on the ground, these boots on the ground have to be ready to, to go in to be helpful, to have people come out. And our programs um, at the Met and in other institutions are our readiness for trainees to come, for us to be uh, supporters of fellows here when the conflict is over, but also to go inside, which is what um, colleagues at the Met are really thinking about from the curatorial and the conservation ranks. And I also bring wearing um, a UNESCO hat that actually um, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, has come forward, in fact, to be helpful on the technology front, on anything that they can do collectively there to um, help and uh, be part of the organizations that will, will um, make um, what you stated earlier actually happen. So I think the um, museums in their capacity as protectors and as preservers are taking their mission enormously seriously and, and will lead the pack um, when it's time to be able to, to be effective there. Great, thank you. Last comment? Um, just a few quick uh, responses. One is to uh, thank Bonnie and acknowledge Bonnie and um, uh, at the World Monuments Fund for the work that, that we've been jointly doing to develop a monitoring uh, means of, uh, uh, in the in the region. Uh, also, it's just one of the things that Getty is doing, which is, includes the training of conservators in the region and doing conservation in the region. Uh, but to the question of moratorium, I mean, there's effectively a moratorium today already in place, which is, of course, that responsible museums are not collecting uh, objects from the region. Uh, that doesn't prevent destruction. It doesn't prevent illegal uh, acquisition. So illegal acquisition is something else, but a moratorium on legal acquisition is not going to do anything. It's the illegal ex acquisition and the illicit uh, excavation and trade that is the problem. It's the black market. And as the colonel said, we don't know the extent of it because it is effectively invisible or the destruction is not invisible, but the trade is invisible. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a black market. Uh, the third, the question about moratorium, um, uh, sorry, about leasing uh, and and and. Uh, just as Larry knows, um, I mean, that the, the remark to the Getty could be applied to the University of Chicago with the Oriental Institute. And the Oriental Institute uh, has, like all other reputable museums, the responsibility to take these things and hold them for the, in the public's interest as public property, effectively. So to lease them to private individuals who can afford to pay lease prices seems to be a backward step, not a positive forward step. Um, and the third is, uh, the, 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 the last to raise is the, the question of, Partage, um, and and that is what built the University of Sh Chicago's Oriental Institute's collection, which is sharing of excavate, excavated objects, distributing the risk to those objects around the world. Um, finally, one last thing, and that is haunted by the the story of the young girl or woman from Tunisia, I believe it was, uh, who said that these things were not of her heritage, but they were of some other's heritage, so she had no reason to want to preserve these things of another heritage. Um, I think there is an inherent conflict in the language that we use often when we talk about these things as being the world's collective heritage, uh, and they're being the local heritage, they being the national heritage of a place. Uh, and we've got to resolve that conflict, because it's perfectly l reasonable if this woman is listening to us talk about these things as being the, uh, the national heritage of Tunisia, for her to say, they're not mine. They're, 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 they just don't belong to me. I, mean, my, I have come from a different heritage than this. They can be destroyed. They don't have to exist in my within the. So the sovereignty of the nation, I think, is a stumbling block that we have to address in some fashion. It's uh, it's preventing us from pursuing um, pursuing, pursuing peace in the region. Okay, here we go. I'm I'm I. I leave it to everyone else to talk about a moratorium, but bear in mind one thing. On the seizures that we make, these guys warehouse things. On one seizure I made that had over 2,000 over 2, Cambodian and Indian and Pakistani statues. In many of those cases, he had those statues in that warehouse for 15 to 20 years, as a gentleman from Singapore pointed out. So I, I don't know about a moratorium. I just know that if it's going to work, it's not going to work tomorrow. Okay, um, first I want to thank everyone here. We clearly needed more time, and this discussion is really just beginning, I think, in earnest among all the different groups that need to come to the table to have an effective and um, reactivated global action plan. Um, all of you should have at your seats or on your seats a survey with asking you if you'd like to stay connected to this. And if you would, it asks the areas that you could contribute, 
uh, either with geographic expertise or specific areas of expertise, please fill that out. There's uh, a number of things. We'd like to get to you a summary of today's discussion with what we drew out of the discussion and also form a working group. Um, and there's other ways to participate. Um, the Asia Society's annual Arts and Museums Summit will take place in Hong Kong on November 19th and 20th. The focus this year is on preserving and protecting uh, our heritage and antiquities and sharing expertise among professionals. You are invited. And Marion Kokut, who heads our museum, is right over there. And, um, but put that on the survey if you're interested in coming. It's at our beautiful, uh, historically preserved center in Hong Kong. Um, on several acres in central Hong Kong, but we'll have uh, several days of discussions and Bun Hui will kick that off and uh, lead that. And so, um, and I also want to mention you should have at your seats a call to action. Um, we felt it's important every time we do these events so that it doesn't become yet another drop of sand in the effort to do things, to put an exclamation point each time. And so our organization, to uh, organize this together, UNESCO, the Antiquities Coalition, the Middle East Institute, we'll be putting this out, Asia Society. We urge you, if you like it, to put it out and promulgate it among your own members, your own organizations. Uh, we certainly can take another stab in a few months at this, but you'll see after the uh, violin music, as I call it, really calling upon different bodies in the world to take the action they can, and I think it re was remarkably prescient to some of the points made today. So uh, do take a look at that. We'd love to see you putting it on your websites, getting out to your members as we plan to, tweeting about it, and uh, hopefully getting citizens around the world also to be part of the dialogue and discussion on this. And the last thing I want to do is say, you are all welcome for a, um, a special pin to go down to our museum if you'd like to, to see this Philippines gold exhibition. These pieces were found in uh, about 40 years ago. And uh, we had, in fact, when we opened this, the family that was very poor that made the first discovery. We have the dented piece that was first hit. They are remarkable. So remarkable, and gold, as you know, can be melted down, and nothing can be looted quite as easily as gold. And that family, who was there and is not wealthy to this day, um, really helped protect those, and then other families in the Philippines and the Central Bank and others. So we brought together the three great collections of these pieces the first time they've been here in the U.S., and we invite you to take a peek. It's uh, on the second floor here, and just get the pin from Sanjeev. I want to thank Sanjeev Sirchan and our entire team here. <laughs> Who did a fabulous job in putting this all together with our partners. And again, to thank Deborah, now officially the amazing Deborah, <laughs> and the Middle East Institute, and uh, everyone who's been here. So thank you very much, and uh, good day. Great.